Regeneration Community Committee on the 8th of November here in the Town Hall and also those members joining us online on Webex. We make you very welcome to the meeting tonight. Um, we're just going to go through the agenda as is, so we'll start with um, apologies. Um, Councillor McGuire, just bear with me, there's a new screen up here, so Councillor McGuire. Uh, my, uh, Carly, thank you, Chair. Uh, there's uh, three apologies from Sinn Féin Group tonight. Councillor Anne-Marie Fitzgerald, Councillor Stephen McCann and Councillor Sean Clark. And just an apology for lateness from Padraig and Kelly. She should join us shortly. Thank you, thank you, Tom. Um, Councillor Warrington. Uh, apologies from Councillor uh, Ray Crawford. Um, and I know that Councillor Irvine uh, and Councillor Armstrong are going to leave. Uh, I know Councillor Irvine's not here, but Councillor, they're leaving early to go to a church service. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is Councillor Garda on? Is there any apologies from the SDLP? Oh, sorry, John. Thanks. Sorry, Chair. Um, apologies from Councillor Blake, Garrity and McPhillips, please. Okay. Thank you. And Councillor Earl Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, apologies from Councillor Keith Elliott, Councillor Paul Robinson and Councillor Paul Stevenson as they are attending the church service. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. I think Councillor McPhillips is online. Kim, was that right? So, well, all right. Thank you. Is there any other apologies, members? Okay. Thank you. Um, Councillor McAleer. All right, Chair. Yes, just in relation to both Councillor Coffey and Councillor Keenan, they're going to be a wee bit late joining the meeting, but they both hope to be. Thank here. you. Thank you. Apologies, Councillor Warrington, again, as ever. I just wanted to say, obviously, Councillor Blake. Um, lost his mother at the yes. end of last week, so um, certainly from our group and uh, deepest uh, condolences to him. Yep, certainly. We're just going to have a, a moment of, um, we certainly do pass on our condolences to Councillor um, Blake on the loss of his mum. I'm Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. With regard to Councillor Blake, obviously on behalf of myself, on behalf of our Democratic Unionist Party grouping, uh, we extend our deepest sympathy to Councillor Paul Blake on the sad passing of his mother. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Hervey. Uh, thanks very much, Chair Mark. Literally, I'm in backside in the seat and I have to go out again. There's a, a remembrance service basically down in the Inniskill um, Presbyterian Church for the Remembrance Boom uh, 35 years ago. So Councillor Armstrong and I are going to request or accuse ourselves from the meeting in a couple of minutes and go down and represent ourselves down there. So that's our apology. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robert. Councillor McGuire. And uh, Norman McGuire, thanks again, Chair. And again, just on behalf of the Sinn Féin group and to pass on condolences to Councillor Blake on the loss of his mother. I, I was present at the funeral, so I have extended my personal condolences, but uh, from the group. Thank you, Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Swift. And I too want to send my condolences sincerely to Councillor Blake on the very sad loss of his mother. May she rest in eternal peace. Thank you, Bernice. And Councillor Don Stephen Donnelly. No, thank you, Chair. I mean, uh, I can't uh, imagine sort of uh, what Councillor Blake is going through right now, but I know that hopefully he'll take some comfort just from the, the solidarity and the thoughts of this chamber being with him at this sad time. Thank, thank you. you, Stephen. And Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, again, just to add my name to those who have offered condolences to Councillor Blake and to his family at this sad time. Just our, our ESG, Goro Hannah. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Josephine Deacon. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for allowing us the opportunity uh, to express our condolences to uh, Councillor Blake. It is indeed a, a, a life-changing moment when one loses a parent and uh, uh, it's a it's a deep loss for Councillor Blake and for his whole family, and I too want to express my sincere condolences uh, uh, to Paul and to the family. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Blake will be assured of our thoughts and prayers this time. Um, just to move on, item two, members, is to sign the minutes and confidential minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 11th of October. That has already been done. And is there any declarations of interest? Item number three. 
Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Declaration of address probably in 6.3, and that's uh, as a member of the Police Shipping uh, Steering Group. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Yes, declaration of interest under 6.5, please plus paper H. It's the LAG item 2.4 as a member of the LAG committee. Thank you. And Councillor Anne Marie Dolly. Thank you, Chair. And it is item 6.4 as an employee of Waterways Ireland. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Item 6.3, uh, OMA Place Shaping. Thank you. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, 8.6 is one of Alliance's nominees to the Education Authority. OK, thank you. Councillor Bale. Uh, I'm not sure I have to declare an interest, but I'll follow my OMA colleague leads and um, declare an interest as the Chair of the OMA Place Shaping Committee. Thank you, Chair. OK. And Councillor Rainey. Five point one chair events and festivals. Thank you, Al, and Councillor Baird. Thank you, Chair. Um, item five one events strategy and uh, six four um, as a director from Anna Lake Land Tourism in relation to the vis visitor experience and non pecuniary interest in both. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Thompson. Sorry about that, Chair. Uh, I think I need to declare an interest my colleagues have. So it's uh, 5.1 uh, events and festivals. Give Thank you. Okay, members, we'll, we'll move ahead with that. And if there's any raise, just give us a shout. Bernice, I haven't forgot about you. I'll pencil you in at this point here. Go ahead. And it's just uh, on behalf of the Council and uh, to let everybody know, in case you didn't already know, congratulations to Derragonley Harps ladies who were victorious on Sunday at Healy Park where they won their Ulster Intermediate title and brought that uh, smashing cup back to the village of Derragonley. And they had an exceptional game with outstanding players and scorers alike. And uh, quite a few of the players are from my own town land, the captain included. So um, each and every one of the girls played amazingly and carefully umpired too, I might add, by our Ulster umpire, Peter, on the top panel, uh, who I actually didn't see on the day. But uh, very well done to the Derragonley Harps ladies. And uh, they are now in the All-Ireland series and in two weeks time, they play in London the team over there, the tower. Uh, so we wish them every success for that. I've already submitted uh, the suitable application for civic hospitality for them, but because we're so busy training and we're headed for the All-Ireland, we'll put the celebrations off within the council until maybe we have two things to celebrate. And um, so that's a bit of a saving actually on the council when you think of it, they're getting two for one maybe. But anyway, um, Without a doubt, uh, more bullibus and uh, massive applause to the Derragonley Harps ladies. Gurmagat. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And Councillor Gallum. I have to come in on, on the same note, Chair. It was a fantastic uh, performance and an absolutely fantastic achievement uh, by the ladies there. Um, in particular, you have to mention Emer, Emer Smith's tally 2 9 of the 2 11. Fantastic. Uh, and not to say that she was the only player who played well, they all put out. Put in a great performance which is what you need a team effort to bring home uh, a cup like that and hopefully as bernice has said we'll be having double celebrations for derrick uh in not, a not too distant future hopefully but uh good luck to them going forward and uh, well done again on an absolutely fantastic result to all the team and management thank you councillor feely yeah yeah i'll be brief yeah just like to agree with the other two previous speakers a great game and a great success for them and fair play to them and wish them all the best luck in the next round and it was an outstanding um performance to the two smith girls they scored 211 between them two nine and two points so it was a great uh, never seen the like of it before so just want to wish them the best luck on the in the next round thank you thank you Anna. okay members we'll just move on now to the matters arising it's item number four and this is from the meeting the minutes of the 11th of october Page one, page two, page three, and page four. There's an item on page four. Just refer members to the correspondence item 8.2. I'll just tick that now. 
Is that um, Kim, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this is in response to representations made by the Council to the DERA Minister in relation to additional financial support in light of increasing production costs and cost of living impacting on our, our local farmers. So the, the response outlines um, the, the Minister's comments around uh, the pressures and his efforts to secure additional funding. Um, it also notes that he has made representations to the Secretary of State uh, on this matter and to the Secretary of State for DEFRA uh, and welcomes the announcement of the Northern Ireland Energy Bill Relief Scheme, which should also support those businesses that have seen spiralling energy costs. Thank you. Members, we've seen the response. Can we have a proposal for an open, please? Councillor Warrington on a seconder. Councillor Armstrong, thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I would have been happy enough to note, but I just I would have to comment that the definitely the minister seems to be speaking out of both sides of his mouth when he sends this letter to us because he talks about the effort that he's personally putting in in terms of securing or attempting to secure a fund of seventy million pounds. But in the same sentence, he also states and acknowledges that no progress can be made until this is considered by the executive alongside other pressures and demands on the budget. And I think it's worth noting that it's his own party that's actually the stumbling block to progressing with that. So whilst I note it, I uh, would question maybe the commitment in terms of delivering upon that, that promise. Thank you, Chair. Okay. And Councillor Anthony Feely. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Coming in on a similar vein, it's desperate that he, he's, he's using that as an excuse and they are, um, the money's there to be spent if they just get back in the Gulf. And I think it's desperate that he's using that as an excuse. And like the farming at the minute, it's just farms is on their knees at the minute with the price of feed and stuff. Red diesel, and you know you know yourself, Mark, on the agriculture liaison group, we always be discussing this, you know. And the, the, on about the single farm payment came out early there in September, so it's long gone spent. And now with the mail bill starting to come in now, and people paying for to take land and stuff, serious bills, we need extra money. And him come out with this, it's just desperate. You know, it's very disappointed of it. And welcome to the, the Northern Ireland Energy Bill Relief Scheme then, at, at, after that then. And there's no way that coming at all. So I don't know even put that in it at all. Just very disappointing. We, ju we just need more money to save at the minute. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Uh, Councillor Walson and Alan yeah, Rainey. Councillor Walson, yeah. Yes, Chair. I, well, I would agree with a lot of the comments there. At, uh, all the stock at this moment in time are in the sheds, and anything that they eat has to be bought, purchased for them. Uh, while they were out on the grass, at least they had some relief. But uh, the uh, cost of everything at this moment in time and it's, it's, it's not coming down. It's going up instead of coming down. And I just read an article that uh, an accountant had in the Farm and Life, and I would have thought a, an educated man should knew better. He said that uh, it was possible that the, the price of fertilizer could go up, and then maybe again it could come down. Well, you don't need to be a brain surgeon to know that it's got to be some other to them. And, uh, you know, to take up a whole page trying to put that over, uh, I don't think was very smart. But it, it is, uh, the industry at this minute in time is really, and the, the, the board flu, I think we have one case of it in Northern Ireland now. So that, that's going to create another problem where the, uh, it, it's happening across the water where everything has to be in uh, housed at the minute. It hasn't come in here yet, but it's on its way. So th that's going to uh, create uh, uh, problems for the industry out there as well. So uh, I don't know. I think they need to wake up and realise that uh, they're dependent on the, the, the agricultural industry for a lot of things. And uh, the general public out there, the stores uh, are, are uh, getting... They'd be keeping a lot of stores going, and as, as uh, Anthony said there, the single farm payment was gone long, long before uh, it, it arrived with the people. So uh, I don't think it's, uh, unfortunately, I <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure some of the rest will keep it going, but uh, that's my honest opinion, and that's uh, as a fact. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wilson, Councillor John Coyle. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um... No, this is uh, from the motion that I had brought. And uh, look, 
welcome what the minister said he's done but um still the farming industry has been grappling with increased prices for you know a lot longer than um you know this 2022 um and we welcome that the single farm payment came in early this year but did he, does he realize that uh you know small family farms especially in fermanagh and oma um the bill for my own fertilizer at home was uh, 75 percent of my single farm payment which then left uh, you know the cost of red diesel increasing cost of electricity cost of meal cost of you know uh, medicines going up it just doesn't it just doesn't make it financially viable for us uh, you know trying to run a home on a, you know on a shoestring and it is difficult we we in the farming community keep a lot of businesses going and it's just detrimental but we something has to be done uh, we can't just uh, say oh we have to wait until an executive is formed uh, many farmers are struggling at the minute and it needs to be sorted out asap so um i don't know uh, I will keep my proposal maybe till December, uh, but uh, there is a proposal I might like to pr uh, propose when we know who to send a letter to. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, members, that's been proposed and seconded for, for noting and agreed. Thank you. Page five of the minutes, page six. Councillor Swift. I, sorry, Mark, it was at the bottom of page four. Oh, sorry. About you. Yeah, and just to note the minutes of the broadband working group and just an aside that mobile signal still being an issue in some areas. And can I propose that the council get in touch with Vodafone? It is an issue that constituents have been uh, highlighting and complained about and I've had the experience myself, so I know it's accurate. The main end of skill into Derragonley Road, the B81, the Vodafone mm. signal is lost and sporadic to say the least so that service provider is not providing the service that those mobile phone customers have uh, contracted to so if the council can please uh, contact vodafone to rectify that problem asap okay, thank you that's proposal and councillor feely H happy second and second thank you councillor mcgallier yeah chair happy enough to support that one i think it's an ongoing she right across this district and on my own day if my throne it's definitely an issue and unfortunately when we did have the meeting with Vodafone we were kind of told and promised that there was going to be follow-up in terms of action from engineers it's never materialized but I know there are some planning applications and for new um, telephone masks so hopefully that'll alleviate some of the problems but I think the issue that exists where previously there was good signal and now it's disappeared is one that questions need to be asked about. Okay, Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. Thanks, Chair, and I just wanted to come in and support that. You'll know yourself, Mark, in Drumquinn and the Drumore area, the signal is terrible as well with Vodafone. It's it's negligible what coverage is given. And I note um, Emmett's comments there about the applications and for mass or additional mass to improve the signal in the area. So I just hope we can maybe get some feedback from Vodafone to, to advise us on the progress they're making. It's very slow. It's very poor in this day and age that people have little or no signal at home. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Barry McElduff. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I wonder uh, could Democratic Services uh, provide me or other members with a contact, public affairs contact for Talk Talk? And uh, I say that because uh, a Dublin Road OMA based family has moved over to Fibrous and all of that, but they're finding it very, very difficult to get out of the contract with Talk Talk. They're making life really difficult for them. And they contacted me yesterday. So just as a counsellor, I'm seeking guidance on how I would go about making representation to a particular company, because I do know the council may have a database of contacts for public affairs officers within these various companies. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. We'll check that out, Councillor and Councillor Green. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was wa uh, wanting to propose that, uh, and it's on the same vein as this, but the EE mast is down in the uh, Brewper area for the last two weeks. EE has made no effort to contact customers, customers or anything. They've left, they've abandoned them. And I'm asking, could the council write to them and uh, ask 
what uh, time scale on getting uh, the service uh, put back. I know uh, my own phones on EE, I have absolutely no coverage, uh, as has a, a lot of people, my friends and neighbours around about, and it's uh, absolutely disgraceful. So I was wondering, could, uh, would that be possible for the council to write, maybe give it a wee bit more authority? Okay, thank you, Councillor Green. Okay, members, I had a proposal to write to Vodafone, that was proposed and seconded. Have anyone to second Councillor Green's proposal? Uh, Councillor Warrington, okay, and agreed on that, members. Just on the contact, Kim, for Councillor McElduff. Can we check that out? We'll check that out, Councillor McElduff, and, and the, you, the office Thanks, will be in touch. Thank you. Yep. yep. Okay, members, page five, page six, page seven, and page eight, page nine, page ten. Page 11. Was there an item on page 11? It's in relation, members, to correspondence item 8.6. John's going to bring that first. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, it's 10.2, uh, just at the bottom of page 11 of, of the minutes, um, where we're asked to make representations to the Minister of Education and, and the Education Authority to highlight the gaps in provision of youth services, especially in Erin West and Mid Tyrone. The response, Chair, is, is in 8.6, as you see, of the correspondence where it's pointed out that there is a local needs assessment for Fermanagh and Oma ongoing at the moment and, and with the, hopefully will lead to a youth development plan. Uh, but they do point out that the budgetary constraints uh, will, mean, will mean that they will focus on, on priority uh, use of resources um, in order to protect the delivery of availability of youth provision to support and protect the most vulnerable children uh, who are engaging with youth services. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John, for that. Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, happy enough to note the correspondence. I do note that particularly it, it refers to um, two areas in uh, my own DA of Midrone and in Erin West that uh, fund has been secured for. And I, I was chatting to the director and thank you for getting back to me in relation to a number of queries it raised in terms of this. Um, I suppose my one of the key concerns I would have in terms of uh, promoting or consult, uh, and getting involved in consultations or getting word out on things is, the, I suppose, that reliance we have on social media. And um, I'm wondering, because there are two particular identified DEAs and, and that within this, is there something we could see about organising maybe on the ground in terms of promoting that within the two DEAs listed, or listed that would maybe encourage people who might otherwise not get involved in something like this to get involved and to get their fair share of the, the funding that is being ring-fenced and is being made available. So if that was possible, I'd like to make that as a proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Gannon. Thank you, Chair. And it's good that EA responded to us relatively quickly. Uh, we don't normally get quick responses, uh, and I raised this myself <coughs> at the time. Um, I think the main point of this was to highlight the, the issue to them, and they do uh, obviously recognise uh, the senior youth officer there, Ryan McGee, uh, who is doing fantastic work uh, for the district. Um, along the same lines as Councillor McAleer, um, in terms of promoting the ability to register with EA, um, obviously if we, if we have groups on record or on our database that we can contact just to say that this is available, if we can promote it on social media and through other methods, if possible, as Councillor McAleer has outlined, um, to encourage youth groups, not just in those areas, but across the district, because uh, it's it's an issue across the district, uh, to uh, register with the EA to, be, to get that eligible funding and the support that's there. But I think we, we did make our point there that these are two in need areas, so hopefully they'll find the funding for the staff uh, as is needed on top of that. Um, they don't say the will there, but they haven't said no at this stage, so we'll, we'll keep, an, keep an eye on it uh, and keep working with the youth services individually as councillors, but I'm happy to, to second the noting and uh, second Councillor McAleer's proposal as long as he's happy enough for social media shout-outs to go. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, members. Councillor Green, was your hand up from before? And then with Councillor O'Reilly. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to see um, the 
new staff employed by the youth service and in different places and I hope the other two areas uh, get their staff. I had the opportunity to meet with Ryan and and the youth service is trying to uh, go back to delivering a more or less a universal service where money allows and certainly the registering of groups which we always had for 25 or 30 years where they were then able to draw down some funding uh, for to support their efforts in delivering locally based youth provision is good to see again. Uh, can I just ask a little bit on the Youth Council, which I know has has sort of changed name and that and a number of us were on that as liaison between the council and the youth service to be able to uh, have that joined up uh, process there of uh, or at the very least the communication feed both ways for young people to actually be able to engage directly with the council. Where is that? Because I don't seem to have had any meetings in a long, long time, and I just wonder where that is. Thank you. John, John. Chair, yes, I can certainly come back to, to Councillor O'Reilly in relation to it. My understanding of the Youth Council is that it did fall into difficulties, and I think COVID was one of those difficulties in, in, in meeting, and I don't think it has ever properly established again, but we can certainly have conversations with the, with the Education Authority to see where it's at in order to get it re-established. Uh, again, see what we can do, and I can I can report back. Thank you. Have enough. Thank you, and Councillor McAlduff. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a related youth issue, youth service issue, indeed. Um, I think uh, Ryan McGee is obviously the the one in correspondence with us. I think he is a senior colleague, Arlene Key, perhaps. Um, I'm proposing that we write to uh, EA Youth Service at a senior level regarding their failure to commit funding uh, in this current six month period to Strathroy Youth Club. Um, now it's it's committed or not committed on a six monthly basis, October to March, as I understand it. And I think the EA, there's an IT issue at work here because there's a contest, Strathroy Youth Club are saying they complied with the registration process. EA is saying they, uh, they failed administratively to register. And uh, there's a contest around that, but just three more points that are very, very relevant in the here and now. Um, two evenings a week, the youth club functions. It needs that financial support from the EA. It's in a neighbourhood renewal area, socially deprived area. And uh, there's a major community safety issue in the Strathroy area that the community have been grappling with in recent months. And I won't go into specifics. It has been documented in the local media. But parents were getting great uh, solace and their young people uh, out of a safe environment at the youth club. So uh, I'm proposing that we write to EA at a senior level, asking them to commit, reinstate that six monthly funding. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor and Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I would like to second uh, Councillor McElduff's proposal. Um, I do agree with him. Uh, that the youth club provides uh, absolutely essential services to uh, the young people of uh, Strathroy. And I think it's very unfortunate. And I hope that this is a simple misunderstanding or a simple error that can be uh, rectified uh, uh, without delay so that uh, that funding can be provide, provided uh, as soon as possible. So I just want to support um, and second Councillor Michael Duff's proposal, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you. Um, so we have the correspondence proposed and seconded. Um, Councillor McAleer and Councillor Gann, they also had a, a separate proposal incorporated there as well, members. And then we had that proposal by Councillor McAleer Duff and seconded by Councillor Dehan of a letter to EA Youth Services at a senior level. Or has everyone agreed with that, members? Thank you. Okay, just back to the minutes, page 11 and page 12. Of matters raised. Thank you. Move on, members, to item five on the agenda. It's the Community and Wellbeing Director Reports 5 1 is to consider reporting events and festivals, paper A. And this was John. 
Thanks, John. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, Chair, it's uh, the report is to, to provide members with an, uh, an update on the event strategy working group, um, which was held on the 12th of September. Normally, these this report would go to the October meeting, but uh, I think uh, given the financial crisis uh, and what was happening and the discussions that were taking place, it was decided to hold off on, on reporting that on this until the on, until this meeting in, in November. Uh, it's also to seek approval for recommendations from the final call for sponsorship um, and to note the expression of interest to trade at corporate events for uh, an, an, an Green Year Festival initiative. Um, the, the minutes of the event strategy working group is included at, at Appendix uh, 1. Uh, in relation to, to sponsorship the, and the final call of sponsorship, which had a closing date at the 4th of September, those were uh, assessed at the event strategy uh, working group and, and, and the recommendations are included in Appendix 2. Um, just in, in relation, there were a number of groups because of the time delay between our last meeting in July and September, um, a number of groups received letters of, of offer for, for sponsorship for events which were taking place prior to tonight's meeting, um, and those were offered to, to run at risk, which they agreed to do so, uh, subject to approval for tonight. There is one application from the Aaron Vintage uh, Classic Show, which is considered ineligible. Um, because we have a very strict uh, policy uh, which says that all publicity materials for the event states this, that admission receipts uh, and all other publicity should not support a charity. Uh, and uh, the, the Vintage Classic uh, show very clearly was uh, stated that all of the support was in aid of the, of the Air Ambulance Northern Ireland charity. And, and therefore, it's unfortunate that, that the Council can't provide sponsorship uh, for, for that event. Um, there were a number of uh, calls for submission of expression of interest for Culture Night uh, in July and August. Uh, 15 groups applied, each received £250, a total sponsorship of £3,750. Uh, and uh, you will see there 2.2.6 that uh, recommendations for all of the other sponsorship are included in, in Appendix 2. The, the, the draft which was uploaded uh, to decision time for members was uh, incorrect. The proper the proper submission is included there at, on decision time uh, tonight uh, again, and, and that was an administrative error more more than anything else. Uh, Two point three of the report uh, gives uh, an, an overview just of the the uh, corporate events. Uh, which will effectively, for Halloween and for Christmas, effectively forms part of the budgetary uh, considerations, which are really for discussion at uh, PNR tomorrow night. Uh, the Green Year, Green Year Festival initiative uh, is proposed that it will be introduced for traders who wish to trade at corporate events. Um, and therefore, traders need to demonstrate the sustainability credentials of, the, of their products that they sell, how they recycle, how they dispose of waste and so on. Uh, and, and need to make sure that all of that is done in a very sustainable manner and environmentally fr friendly manner for those that are, are those uh, that, that we sponsor. Uh, and finally, the event strategy. There was an update at the event strategy working group in relation to uh, the, the strategy itself. Um, so, Chair, it's recommended that the Council notes the draft minutes and actions and recommendations of the event strategy working group of the 12th of September, approves the recommendations for support of the corporate sponsorship 22-23 model for third-party organised events, notes the expression of interest to trade at corporate events and Green Year Festival initiative, and notes the update and actions of the event strategy of the events and festival strategy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, John. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's uh, already mentioned in the minutes, but just to be safe, um, just need to declare an interest as a member of the Golden Apple players who are recommended for funding under this report. Thank you, Stephen. Councillor Adam Gannon. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, uh, I'm happy to propose uh, the report there as, as outlined. Um, it's good to see. Uh, kind of linked to this is obviously we're, we're providing financial support for sponsorship and things like that. Um, I was just wondering, because uh, it is linked and it's not in the agenda around strategic capital grants, I know there's a bit of work being done on that still, if that could be maybe, because normally this would be, there'd be something for review in this in this month's agenda. I don't know if it's going to be discussed tomorrow night. Would I be correct in saying, I think I'm seeing a nod there, but um, 
just so we can get that discussed because there's projects on hold um, that I know of in, in the community and people are asking me about it. Um, so I'll just, uh, Kim, I think. Thank you for that question. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah, the strategic capital grants will be considered as part of the estimates process. So the, the money um, will be considered in terms of our ongoing capital plan. And uh, it'll be a decision for members then in terms of our wider financial context if that money uh, continues to be available in, in the year to come. So we have noted uh, and corresponded with all applicants to advise of the time frames um, so that they can factor that into their their ongoing work. Thank you. Okay, members, have we just a seconder for the um for the report before us? Councillor Warrington, happy to second. Are we all agreed, members? Okay. Thank you. I think Councillor Green maybe his hand was up from before, but we'll just check that again. Okay, 5.2 members is to <clears throat> consider a report on regulation of cosmetic treatments in Northern Ireland, Paper B. Thanks, Thank thanks Chair. Yes, the Council have uh, received a request from the Local Authority Health and Safety Liaison Group uh, to ask them to, to ask the Council to write to the Department of Health to seek better regulation of cosmetic treatments in, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, in October 21, the botulinum uh, toxin and Cosmetics Fillers Children's Act 2021 is quite a mouthful. Uh, it came into force in England, making it illegal uh, to administer Botox or, or filler by any way of injection for cosmetic purpose uh, for persons under the age of 18. There, there is no such law in, in Northern Ireland here. Uh, and further to that, the UK government recently confirmed uh, its intention to, to introduce licensing regime uh, for non-surgical uh, cosmetic procedures uh, in England. Um, through an amendment to the Health and Care Bill. And again, there is no such uh, in planned introduction of any licensing regime uh, here. In, in recent years, there has been a significant increase in, in, in the number of non-surgical procedures. Um, and, and the lack of regulation, I suppose, in, in a sense, is, is slightly worrying. Uh, and many practitioners are performing treatments without being able to evidence the appropriate training or accreditation to the standards that may be required for, for, for such treatment. Um, and, and then the legislation which is available for environmental health officers in order to regulate this isn't therefore fit for purpose. Um, so it, it is, and you will see in Appendix 1 there, a draft letter uh, to the Department of Health um, for, to, for consideration to be given to uh, asking for better regulation uh, of cosmetic treatments uh, here, along with the introduction of licensing scheme for, for non-surgical cosmetic uh, procedures. Uh, so therefore, Chair, it's, it's recommended that the Council approves the correspondence being sent to the Department of Health uh, requiring for better regulation and the introduction of a licensing scheme. Thank you, John. Councillor Mbengalier. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm more than happy to note this, uh, this particular uh, recommendation, I think, the just being mindful of the significant pressures placed on many groups of society in terms of the projected image and the appearance of the individual and especially the pressures that are put on many of our younger residents i think it is hugely important that this area is properly regulated and licensed and that the highest ethical safety and environmental health issues are followed um, as noted in the correspondence and in the report some of these treatments are quite invasive and to think that, as as is identified, that some of these are being practiced, uh, maybe without strict guidelines, uh, it's hugely concerning. So, yeah, more than happy to to support and to propose that we do proceed with that course of action. Thank you, Thank Chair. Thank you, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor McLear stole most of my thunder, so I'm going to be quite happy to second. Uh, it is quite uh, worrying that in this day and age that this is still unregulated. It's uh, harder to buy a pack of, bag of chips in a chip shop than it is to have some of these uh, invasive type of uh, procedures carried out. So I fully agree. Uh, also, uh, see it again, it'll be another example of uh, where legislation will come through and, and we will be given more duties to carry out without the adequate funding. But that's something we'll have to wait for further down the line. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. 
Thank you very much, Chair. Well, I agree with the other two speakers, uh, and I'm happy to support uh, our actions that, we, uh, that were taken in this regard. It has been mentioned, you know, it has been referred to myself uh, by, by people out there as well about this issue. So uh, I think it is a worrying thing, and, and especially it's un, unregulated. And uh, I, I'm, I agree with the course of action that uh, this council will be taken. So thank you. That. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. I mean, um, this does touch on something that I have been worried about because I think that there has been a substantial and worrying rise, actually, um, particularly, I mean, I've noticed in lip filler treatments um, just in wider society over the last number of years, and in particular, just on Instagram, I mean, the widespread popularization and spread of it through influencers and other public figures is worrying in the context of environments like ours where there is that lax regulatory framework or that uh, lax amount of guidance. So I think that the, this recommendation is an important one that we should explore and put forward. So more than happy just to lend my support. Thank you. And Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. And I want to thank John for his very comprehensive report. Uh, Chair, I couldn't agree more with uh, everything that is uh, detailed in this report. It's absolutely essential that we do have uh, the legislation that enables us to regulate these uh, cosmetic treatments and also uh, to introduce a, a, a licensing scheme so that um, those uh, companies that offer these treatments uh, will provide the services to the highest possible standards. However, it is a matter of uh, grave concern, and I think uh, Councillor, previous speakers, including Councillor Stephen Donnelly, have summed it up very well. I mean, there are a lot of young people who might be unduly influenced uh, by what they see on social media and the so-called influencers and uh, might seek these treatments inappropriately and uh, uh, regret it later on. Not all of these cosmetic procedures are successful. Many young people are left with a, a significant uh, um, you know, disfigurement uh, of their features, particularly when these procedures are carried out on the face. And it is a matter of grave concern uh, to parents and all of those who have uh, uh, very justifiable concerns regarding the impact of these treatments on the mental health uh, of uh, our young people. So uh, very pleased that this report has come bef before us and I, I want to lend it my support, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, members, that's um, proposed and seconded and agreed. Thank you. We'll move on to 5.3. It's to consider a report on Global Voices, Local Choices Project, Paper C. Thank you, Chair. Yes, a new project, Global Voices, Local Choices. It's been led by the, the National Museums uh, Northern Ireland, uh, the Northern Ireland Museums Council and the African Caribbean Support Organisation for Northern Ireland. Um, it, it's to bring diverse cultures and di different perspectives uh, in through the, the local museums uh, and empowering them to make choices relating to the museums and, and the collections and how they're interpreted and so and so on. Uh, and it is to raise awareness and understanding of the collections uh, and, and to provide a new approach uh, to how the, the, those collections can be implemented in, in, and, and indeed what those collections, what should be included in them. Um, so it'll be an opportunity to provide those in, in marginalised and uh, elements of our society in order to bring them into the, the museum network. Um, there are a number of uh, museums which have been uh, asked if they would be interested in the in the project. Uh, ourselves uh, being being one of them as an accredited uh, as an accredited uh, museum, one of five in in Northern Ireland. Um, and it will involve working with the community services and good relations uh, people to identify the, the appropriate groups that should be involved in, in, in the project. Uh, to participate in it, um, it there, our commitment uh, will be to identify a lead officer and the appropriate groups and providing them with the opportunity to display and, and the full project will be, will be, will be funded. Um, so uh, therefore, Chair, it's uh, recommended um, that the Council approves participation in the Global Voices Local Choices Project 
enters into that partnership agreement and commits to the decolonisation process for his museum and the development and diversity uh, within the museum audience. Thanks, Thank Chair. you for that, John. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, again, uh, very happy to propose that we proceed with this. I think it's the aim stated in the report are commendable, um, and I, the, the idea there that we're uh, bringing diverse cultures and perspectives into local and national museums through empowering people, that it's an opportunity to present marginalised global voices and learn from the expertise within these communities. Um, and again, the, the project or the proposed display in both the Fermanagh County Museum and the Street Arts Centre and, and next winter, winter 2023, is something that's really commendable. The idea behind the project that the Council commits to the decolonisation process in museums to develop diversity in museum audiences, it, again, it's all very encouraging stuff. I think the this over, overall, this initiative is a hugely positive one. It's most welcome as we emerge from Black History Month last month, and again, being mindful of the Council's duty to promote and include minority voices in all our actions. I think that's hugely important. Um, this proposal offers the option to move away from an, the narrative that history is written by the victors, and it gives an opportunity to shine a light on the harsh reality of colonialism across the globe. So we are fully supportive of it and looking forward with interest to see what the outcome will be. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Anthony Feely. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, and happy to support this as a, a subject that I have big interest into and I'm happy to second the recommendation. Of, I see on 2.4 there about the Black Lives Matter movement. It brought great talk, not just in America, but all over the world about the injustice that was done on people just because of the colour of their skin. So uh, we are equal, not, not different what colour we are. So I'm just glad to see it and glad to see that noted there as well. So happy to support. Thank you for that, Sackman, Councillor. Councillor McLaughlin. Yeah, this is a, a massive piece of work. Uh, for the museums, and, and it's good to see it coming forward. It opens up a, a gateway for for many more people within our communities to engage with the museum and and all the history that's there. And given the, the fact that we are a gas in town, we have a history in many of these areas where uh, where troops served for the most of their working lives and then returned. The skins, I think, were on the road for about 190 years before they came back down to Skillen. So uh, there's a lot of young men from this district would have been abroad, and this is a different picture of the history that they brought back that we're seeing from a different perspective. So it's very interesting to see it coming forward. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor O'Coffe. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm happy to support this. I think it's important that uh, we do have a process uh, whereby the hidden histories of uh, in particular, uh, those from colonial by, uh, countries and people of colour are uh, brought to the surface. Um, too too long, uh, we've had an you know a Eurocentric or no doubt an imperialist um, history of the past, and this has largely excluded many people and the majority of the humanity, as it as it turns out. Um, so it's important that we uh, are supportive of this process and the, the bringing back of these uh, hidden and repressed, if not oppressed, histories of the past, uh, because I think they're very relevant uh, at this moment in time where we've got uh, a lot of uh, wars and conflicts, many of which have their roots in, in this history. And uh, we need to try and find a way forward for all of us uh, together. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, I suppose I agree with a lot of the comments of uh, Councillor McLaughlin there. Uh, he refers to skill being a garrison town, and as is Oma, a garrison town from, from the 1800s. So there's many people have passed through, uh, especially St. Lucia Barracks, and also the old Lisnelli Barracks when it was there, now the, the Stuhl campus site. So uh, it's very important that the story is told. Uh, it refers to, you know, obviously black lives matter, but also all lives matter. So that, that's very important as we move forward and we, and we take everything, everything into consideration uh, and uh, from, from all nationalities and right across the board. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. 
Councillor O'Coffey, you're ready in now, very quick. Yeah, it's a related thing I, I wanted to raise. It anyway. um, I saw an article recently saying that the some of the artefacts that were uncovered in the uh, the um, there was an archaeological find at the uh, Cranog uh, in the north of Enniskillen had yet to be presented in any museum. So I'm just wondering if this is an opposite moment to really uh, question whether there is a possibility of bringing those uh, those artefacts into public view, because I think uh, there would be huge interest in that if possible. I don't know if that's something we can advance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We can take that on board, John. Thank you. OK, I think that's all, members. That's proposed by Councillor McAleer and seconded by Councillor Feely. Thank you, members. All agreed. Move on now. Members, item six is the regeneration planning. Director reports 6.1 is to consider the draft response to the Department for Infrastructure regarding the consultation on the transboundary application of Finn Cashel Donegal Road Pedagogy. The planning reference numbers attached, paper D. Thank you, Chair. So this paper outlines correspondence which we've received from the Department of Infrastructure, who's been consulted by Donegal County Council in relation to an application near Pedigo. Uh, an extension of time has been granted until the 11th of November. The application is for the intensification of the existing composting and waste recovery activities uh, at a site in Pedigo from 25,000 tonnes to 150,000 tonnes with associated and ancillary site works. Um, Envirogrind is the facility. It's an existing facility where the applicant is seeking planning permission to intensify their waste activities. So it's a pre-existing commercial development. It's recommended that the Council responds to the consultation, advising it's subject to careful consideration of all of the outstanding consultation responses and impacts, uh, that, particularly from the Fermanagh Noma District Council area, and the conditioning of any mitigation where necessary that the Council has no objections to the proposal. So it's recommended that the Council agrees the draft consultation response outlined in Appendix 1A for submission to the Department for Infrastructure. Thank you. Councillor John Coyle. Thank you, Chair, um, and thanks, Kim, for the uh, synopsis. Um, I would be happy to propose uh, to send this response to the department. Uh, I think it's uh, well worded from the planning department and uh, uh, benefit to, um, I know it's a family run business, so uh, it's good to support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. John McLaughlin. Yeah, I would agree with Councillor Coyle. It, it is a family-run business, and uh, it, it employs a few people. I, I know it, it's into the tens of people that they employ down there, and, and it's both sides of the border. It's, it's, it's literally a mile into Donegal, just to the other side of the village of Patigo. I passed it quite a few times, and it's been interesting to see the site growing over the years. So with with the, the that well-worded report, considerations by the planning uh, if that could be forward i think that it would be agreeable to see that going ahead you happy to second that second you? yeah thank you councillor mcgillier thank you chair yeah um i suppose i unlike the previous two speakers i would have a, a few reservations about this um i don't think anybody here is going to have any issue with with composting um but the waste recovery activity is something that i would have a concern with the increase that's uh, noted in this from 25,000 to 150,000 tonnes, a 600 per cent increase in the scale of operations would be very concerning. The boundary of the proposed site within one kilometre of the Fermanagh Noma District Council area close to Lower Loch Erin is something that would certainly raise uh, question marks with, with myself. In the report, page two, we talk about residential amenity. It's hugely important for residents local to the site that any activity associated with this, as noted in the report, has the potential to have a detrimental impact upon their, their amenity, uh, including uh, traffic, noise, dust, vibration, and general disturbance. And on natural history, it no, I note the comment that within the council response that DERA will take the lead on issues in relation to natural heritage. However, their comments are not yet available. So without sight of those comments, I would be very reticent to pass this without any objection. I think if we're saying we have no objection to or we're supportive of something without access to all the information, 
we're certainly in a in a very dangerous situation there. So I would be proposing that we actually either hold fire until we do have access to the relevant information or that we don't say we have no objections to this because I don't see how we can have no objection to it without access to the full detail. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And Councillor O'Coffey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, like uh, Councillor McAleer before me, I, I, um, I would have nothing but admiration for the work of EnviroGrind uh, as a composting company. Uh, anyone involved in uh, even like myself, a two-bit uh, organic farming or car uh, gardening rather is uh, would would know about Envirogrind uh, compost and uh, how important it can be. And I think the process, my understanding uh, that they uh, engage in, is a, a very good environmental process. Uh, that said, uh, there is this issue of waste recovery and exactly what that means, and a little bit of the uncertainty certainly that Councillor uh, McAleer has raised. I would just like to see more detail on that, but I, I'm certainly happy uh, to be in general support of composting. Uh, expansion of that 500% uh, is a very significant expansion, if that's what it is. But if it was something else, we'd need to just know that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And Councillor Alex Baird. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> happy enough for the original proposal and seconding. But I'm just wondering, uh, as an aside issue of this, I understand that there are some councils in Northern Ireland who, at their recycling centres, actually engage in the composting process themselves. Now, they may sell the, pro the product or they may give it away. I'm just wondering, when you take in the cost and the carbon footprint there is of delivering the raw materials to this process, and again, being the neoliberal that I am, I wouldn't want to put any impediment away in, in, in a, a private company uh, being successful. But is there any reason why we as a council don't compost? Because it's a very simple process, as I understand it, why we don't compost our, our, our waste and uh, reduce the carbon footprint uh, of delivery to uh, the recycling process. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Baird. An answer for that. <laughs> well, I, I can't comment on, on whether we compost or not, um, but I can certainly ask that our, our waste service would bring a report back uh, to clarify that as an issue. In terms of some of the other comments, uh, just in terms of residential amenity or report notes, the assessments carried out, and there is a sufficient buffer to third party properties to avoid adverse impact from dust, odour, noise, etc. Um, the, the response also notes that a series of mitigation measures have been prepared and outlined within the environmental impact assessment, and we are recommending that Donegal would secure those uh, mitigation measures by condition uh, in terms of the, um, the overall response uh, and, and the, the assessment of the, of the application. Um, we, we have also recommended that while we haven't seen Deere's response, that, that Donegal County Council would ensure that those comments, when received, are carefully considered and appropriate mitigation included where, where necessary. Okay, members, well, we do have a proposal by Councillor John Coyle, seconded by Councillor John McLaughrey, um, that we go with the recommendation as is. Um, are we all agreed? Uh, okay, and then well, we have a uh, dissent there. Councillor McAleer, would you be happy to that that, that go through with your um, hesitation noted on that until the information, or do we need to take it to a vote at this? Sure. Uh, obviously, I won't. If I'm objecting to it, I'm not going to be happy that it's proceeding. But uh, I would like my objection to be noted. To be yes, noted, thank certainly. You. That's that's what I was gathering. Okay, Councillor O'Coffey. Can I ask just uh, that that wording that I, I requested information on that waste? Um, Recovery. What does that actually mean? I don't have a specific definition, member, but it it is around the circular economy principles. So it's wasting, it's minimising waste going to landfill, and maximising waste as as a resource. I can certainly um, secure further details and share those with the member after the meeting. Okay. Thank you for that, Kim. Okay, members. Thank you. We'll move on to 6.2.
um, is to consider the draft response to the consultation from Derry City and Straban District Council regarding Altgolan One Farm and the plan and reference numbers there, members, as well, paper E. Thank you, members. So again, this is a, a consultation um, opportunity. Um, current application is a full application seeking to increase turbine height and the wind farm lifespan again from 30 years to 35 years. So it's recommended that the council responds to the consultation, advising that subject to careful consideration of all of the outstanding consultation responses and impacts upon the environment, human health and residential amenity from the Fermanagh Noma District Council area as well as the conditioning of any mitigation where necessary, that the Council has no objections. And again, the consultation response is attached at Appendix 1A. Thank you, members. We've had sight of that response. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to just take a different route again. I think we shouldn't be supporting this. I'd actually express serious concern about the proposal to recommend plan and approval as outlined in the documentation, documentation in front of us. Um, just, I think it's worth noting that the application coming forward at this time is significantly different and very significantly different from that uh, which was submitted in 2006 or indeed uh, that the, was proposed by the PAC decision. Furthermore, additional information has come forward alerting this Council to serious environmental issues impacting this type of proposal in the same borderland of Tyrone and Donegal. Uh, in light of all the information now available, I would actually say it would be reckless, in my opinion, for this Council to recommend in favour of the application. Furthermore, in the absence of full consideration of all the consultation responses, a number of which had not been received when this recommendation was drafted, it's imperative that FODC actually recommend refusal. Again, very quickly going through the reports, we're extending this to a 35-year lifetime, or proposing to extend it to a 35-year lifetime. Increasing the, the height of these turbines to 149.99 metres, and thanks to the director who was again in contact with in, in relation to this, I was wondering what the significance of that was, um, other than, I suppose, 150 metres being noted as a, huge, like a large turbine. There, there doesn't seem to be implications, but I'm, I'm very concerned by that. And again, looking through the, the actual application that's noted as one of the attachments, I have serious concerns about the history of this application, noting the number of requests to very previously agreed conditions after planning had been granted, notably around uh, ornithological mitigation strategy and ornithological management and mo monitoring, uh, as well as the, the number and the height of these turbines. Looking back there, you're talking about things in terms of habitat management, snipe habitat management, um, ornithological management monitoring, uh, archaeological uh, report conditioning decommission. These are all things that this company has actually sought discharge of their responsibility to do after being granted with these conditions in place. So with all of those noted, uh, as well as I suppose Appendix 1A noting that on page two, a wind farm on this site of this scale and magnitude proposed will present a very significant change to the landscape when, construct when constructed. And again, reading through the submissions on the planning portal, by local residents. 100% of those are opposed to this being developed in their area. So I think we have to be cognizant of all of that. And there are letters there from people who previously hadn't objected, but due to the size and scale of this are now objecting. So I don't see how we as a council can be satisfied to support this or how we can put our name to it. So I'm proposing that we don't actually support it. We oppose it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's your proposal. Thank you, Councillor. Now, members, is there any other comments or proposals? We've seen the recommendation as is in the report. And you've heard Councillor McAleer's proposal. Councillor O'Coffey? Yeah, Councillor, uh, I'm just happy to support that proposal. I, I think um, Councillor McAleer's made a very cogent case there, I think, uh, that uh, we should be a little careful on all of this. And I know that many members have... Um, raise concerns around intensive development of wind turbines and issues around um, the heights and so on. And I'm sure uh, we need to be consistent in this approach. So I'd happy to second that, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Kim, would you like a comment? Sorry, at this point. Thank you. 
Yeah, yes, Chair. Um, I suppose just firstly to note that the application has been supported by an environmental impact assessment, which um, Derry City and Strabane Council will give consideration to in their assessment of the application. Um, just to note that in terms of the application itself, it's to note that the location of the wind turbines has been slightly amended to that which has been previously consented, um, but there are other associated site works. Uh, in terms of the scale of the increased <coughs> turbine, uh, to note the turbine technology has improved in, in the intervening years since these turbines would first have been um, would first have been installed, and, and we are increasingly seeing applications now to extend the lifespan of wind farms and to increase the size of turbines, and that is driven by um, in, in improved technology and enhanced uh, information around performance um, and, and life expectancies. To note also in terms of the, the impacts, the site is, uh, and the, the response notes, that the site's adjacent to uh, Loch Braden area, and in our local development plan and the assessment of the wider landscape, uh, this area has been assessed to accommodate, to have the highest underlying capacity for wind farms, so it can accommodate um, large and potentially very large 150 metre plus turbines in some locations, and that's in, in relation to our own assessments. So uh, just some further information. Thank you, Kim, for that. Councillor John Coyle. Thanks, Chair. Um, no, I, uh, the area that's in question here um, sits in within the Fermanagh and Oma, um, and there is residents that uh, we have to be cognizant of and their views. Um, you know, like, as Kim says, that, you know, this area is for wind farms, but it's, it is it's well populated in some parts of that area like and um I do have concerns maybe that um shadow flicker uh, in properties and uh, so forth and the reports you know state that the, you know timing and all modeling is done as much as possible but um I still I, I do just voice my kind of concerns and you know, there are residents, this is a Derry City and Strabane application, but uh, we have to make sure that our residence is protected as much as possible. Okay, members, we'll put Councillor McAleer's proposal to the floor, which would, would be to go against the recommendation um, as outlined in the draft response. Are, are we all agreed? No. Okay, members, we'll put that... Um, to a vote. I think it's the easiest way to sort that at this stage. A recorded vote should have been requested. Okay. Just give that a second to get set up members in the chamber and on WebEx.
Seven, yes, four, no. Okay, members. Okay, Peter. Okay, so Tim's just going to announce the result of the vote. Okay, so the outcome of the result of the vote is that there are 11 votes for, seven votes against, and three abstentions. So that's carried, members, Carry. and the response will be updated accordingly. Thank you. Moving on to 6.3, members, is to consider update report on OMA Place Shaping Plan, paper F. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, um, members will be aware that the Council previously secured funding from the Department for Communities to take forward a place shaping plan for OMA to update the former master plan, and a steering group was established comprising elected members, statutory and other partners, and representatives in the community, voluntary sector, and the business community to uh, progress that piece of work. The steering group has met regularly throughout that development process, and the purpose of this report is to update members on progress towards the development of that OMA place shaping plan and to seek approval. So the aim of the OMA place shaping plan is to inform future decision making, uh, to place OMA as a vibrant town for current and future generations. The plan overall is an informed guide with a range of themes, actions and best ideas uh, to achieve the vision um, uh, and to be delivered across the six key themes of a green heart, a beautiful place, a connected people in place, an inclusive place, a thriving town and a vibrant place. And that work in terms of the plan has been supported by a detailed baseline analysis report, which was shared previously with members. So the draft plan was previously approved for public consultation. It went out then from the 18th of July to the 13th of September, and we received 234 public consultation responses, uh, building on the engagement with over 500 contributions through the early development work. So public consultation has identified that 76% of res respondents supported the overarching ambition with further commentary on focus on engaging with people outdoors, considering traffic congestion and, and use of natural assets. There were a range of levels of support which are outlined in paragraph 2.6 for um, elements within the plan. Uh, and some areas where lower levels of support were identified, and these were in relation to areas which are often um, contentious around opportunities, perhaps to trial uh, pedestrianisation and um, people first places. So a, a more detailed overview of the consultation findings is attached to Appendix 1 to the report, together with an overview of uh, minor changes to the draft plan. The OMA Place Ship and Steering Group met on Tuesday, 25th of October, and at that meeting, the steering group um, unanimously approved the final version of the OMA Place Shipping Plan, which is attached at Appendix 2. A further meeting has now been scheduled to consider how to take forward the delivery of the plan and the arrangements for ongoing management, and also to conduct an evaluation of the process to develop the plan to inf inform future work on place shipping. In terms of the implications, each project within the plan will be further scoped in terms of feasibility and cost appraisal, including the identification of external funding opportunities and scope for partner contributions, and individual approval will be sought through Council for each of the projects as we bring it forward. Um, there are no additional resourcing requirements identified at this time. So it's recommended that the final version of the OMA Place Shipping Plan is approved, and that a further report then is provided to outline the proposed arrangements for management and delivery of the plan following further engagement with the OMA Place Shipping Steering Group. Thank you very much, Kim. Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, can I say uh, thank you to Kim and indeed all the uh, officers and indeed the key stakeholders who played a huge amount of work uh, in actually bringing this uh, to fruition here. Uh, there's been a significant amount of work invested and evidence gathered uh, and indeed conversations about what we want OMA to look like in the future. And it's been useful to kind of go back to basics and actually start thinking about ambitious ideas for what we want the town to look like within the next 10 years. And I suppose the key thing that I think people in OMA want to be said is that we don't just want another document that's going to sit on the shelf. We want something that is live and breathing and it's going to make a tangible difference to the lives of the people that we represent in OMA. And that's actually going to make a strong contribution to making this mission statement a reality that OMA will become an increasingly vibrant, healthy, attractive and inclusive town, a reimagined and animated green heart for the district, enhanced by progressive regeneration and revitalization in tandem with enhanced connectivity. 
just uh, want to touch on one thing that while the report refers to lower levels of support for certain proposals, I think that it is fair to say that actually all the proposals and themes that went out to consultation did, I think, receive support from the majority of feedback, although some were uh, more controversial than others. But I think some issues such as uh, phase pedestrianisation, I think that there was uh, a broad view that uh, with additional clarity and explanation and teasing out of the detail of what that would look like in practice, that actually we would be able to secure even broader uh, community backing for the implementation of such ideas. But that's something to be ironed out uh, in future. But on the whole, the place shipping plan does represent an ambitious and detailed bedrock of ideas to make OMA more prosperous, connected, happier and sustainable. And it seems to me that passing this tonight must be regarded as the start of a journey and certainly not a conclusion, because ultimately we have this bedrock of ideas. We have a lot of ambition. We have a lot of creativity here. But ultimately, we need to ensure that statutory partners, government ministers, whenever they come back uh, to their place, are ultimately engaged with actually making these ideas a reality in terms of support, in terms of finance, and in terms of making sure that we can make these <laughs> ideas a reality. So, Chair, there's a huge amount of ambition here, and I think that if we can make it a reality, we can bring greater opportunities to OMA and enhance its position as the county town of Tyrone. And on that basis, I'm more than happy to propose the, the recommendations. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor McElduff. Okay, thank you, Chair. Chair, can I second? The adoption of the report and uh, just ask him for you know clarity around the future of the steering group has it one more meeting left is it a long-term structure and is there any barriers till reconstituting or meeting again you know in, in the context of the oma town center forum thank you chair thank you thank you chair um There'll certainly be one more meeting of the steering group. Um, I suppose it depends on progress. We we do need to have a discussion then about how we do take the the plan forward. What is the appropriate structure for us to do that? Uh, and also, we want to do an evaluation of of the process uh, and pick up any learning from that and uh, and get the feedback from those involved in the process in terms of how they find it. So at least one more, but at least one more meeting, but possibly. Um, you know, a, a couple until we, we scope out that piece of work and are in a position to bring a report back to council. Um, I, I think part of the consideration, Chair, would be would that, would a new vehicle to take this plan forward replace or uh, subsume the OMA Town Centre Forum? I think that's part of the discussion that we need to have. So uh, I suppose I wouldn't make any further comment on it at this stage other than that needs to be part of the part of the conversation. Thank you, Kim, for that clarity. Okay, members, that's proposed and seconded. Thank you. Um, 6.4 is to consider update report on draft visitor experience development plan. Paper G. Thank you, Chair. So, uh, again, at the July committee meeting, members approved the draft visitor experience development plan for Fermanagh Lakelands and for Oman Despairns and agreed the arrangements for public consultation alongside agreeing that we would conduct a review of tourism governance and delivery options alongside that public consultation process. So the purpose of this report is to update members on, on the outcome of public consultation and to seek approval of the final VDP uh, following consideration of that feedback. I also want to update members on the timeline in respect of tourism governance and delivery options. So the draft VDP is a 10-year strategic plan it's been jointly funded by Council, Tourism NI and by Waterways Ireland. It sets our strategic vision uh, for delivering an authentic, sustainable, regenerative and ambitious tourism plan for, for the district, uh, taking account of the two key visitor propositions of Fermanagh Lakelands and Oma and the Spairns. Um, so in terms of the 12 week public consultation, uh, a detailed public consultation report is attached as Appendix 1 to this report. We conducted that over 12 weeks and uh, that encompassed a wide range of activity, including online stakeholder engagement events, in-person industry briefing events, uh, an online industry briefing event, four drop-in information sessions in Enskill and Enoma, a range of information stands at council venues and an online survey. We had a total attendance of over 90 at that range of events and then a, uh, an additional 131 survey responses submitted. Uh, and again, that followed on from significant engagement during the development process when we engaged with a wide range of stakeholders. 
So at 213, I've outlined uh, of the survey responses, the extent of um, re response, positive response in relation to the questions asked. And members will note that there was overwhelming support for the direction of the Visitor Experience Development Plan with 93% in favour um, and high levels of support across all uh, of the questions um, and areas that we consulted upon. So both quantitative and qualitative feedback is, is outlined in the public consultation report. It's proposed that a number of minor amendments are made to the draft VDP to finalise the document and that we work to make it publicly available as soon as possible. So some proposed amendments or the proposed amendments are outlined in paragraph 2.215, which uh, includes updating the VDP vision to include the words to, to reference businesses and also to reference inclusive growth. So the proposed new vision is that Fermanagh and Oma will be globally recognised as an exemplar regenerative tourism destination, a place where visitors become temporary locals, immersed in a rich natural and cultural heritage, and where local people, communities and businesses are supported through inclusive growth and collaboration. We want to include uh, specific definitions on sustainable and regenerative tourism to build the understanding of the difference between those, to add further information on how we will take forward the action plan, add an action with an enabling industry on attracting employment talent to the area. We want to include additional information on planned and proposed capital investment by Waterways Ireland, to align our priority international markets with Tourism Ireland and uh, their 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 marketing uh, information to clarify some of the figures quoted and the present presentation of some pieces of information. I also want to add a further action around maximising opportunities for visitor experiences through our events and festival strategy as well. So officers are working with the consultants engaged to uh, update that plan and a copy will be provided to all members in, uh, shortly. In terms of the review of tourism governance and delivery, this was also a recommendation um, from Council in July. Uh, it's recognised that we do need to look, so alongside agreeing the new strategic vision, we need to look at how we deliver uh, the, this plan into the future. Um, and we are conducting that review uh, of governance and delivery. Um, we are, as members will be aware, looking closely at our budgetary position. So in line with that work on the budgetary position, we aim to bring a report to the December meeting of the committee in terms of the conclusions of that uh, ongoing review work. So the recommendations are that the public consultation report at Appendix 1 is noted, that the Visitor Experience Development Plan is approved, subject to the inclusion of the amendments at paragraph 215, and that a report on findings of the review of tourism governance and delivery is presented to the December meeting of the committee for consideration. Thank you very much, Kim. Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, um, I suppose at the last meeting in relation to this, I expressed some reservations about inclusion of the inclusive growth idea. And I think the idea of growth and unlimited growth is something that really has led to a lot of problems. So I wouldn't be in favour of including that because I think if you, if you read through the line it's really um, it's not relating to local people and it's not relating to local communities I think it is something that's been kind of shoehorned in there um, taken away from the tourism aspect of it and I, and I would actually propose that we proceed we can proceed with the other recommendations but I would be inclined to leave the the statement as it is, um, even if we include on businesses, that's fair enough. But I don't think the inclusive growth aspect of it is. I'm, I'm very supportive of the work that has been done by by the the director and by the 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 staff members in relation to it, and indeed the across the the district the input that has been put on this. But I think the focus has to remain on tourism and the aspects of attracting people to the area. Um, and just reading through the the second appendix there and the wonderful work that's been done right across the district and again i have to reference particular the the oma and the sparens end of it and i suppose the the significant uh, attention paid and praise given to on craigan and um, just where i grew up as well it, it's really worth praising 
all these fine locations and all these fine industries and businesses that we do have locally. But I think just given the, I suppose, the outline and the idea behind the report, I would just be inclined not to include that particular reference as part of as part of our overall project. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Earl Thompson. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, can I also thank uh, Director Kim McLaughlin and, and everybody involved in this. There's a lot of work that's went into this. And I've heard what uh, our Director has said. And uh, I'm happy to propose the recommendations as she has listed them. Thank you. Okay, members. Uh, Councillor Michael Duff, was your hand up from previous, or are we on this item? No, on this item, uh, Councillor. Yes, go ahead. Yep, go you. ahead. Uh, again, thank Kim and the team for producing this. Um, I suppose uh, on Saturday I, I walked to the top of Mullacharn with a large group of Gorton Glen Forest Park walkers, and uh, it was a great occasion. We were celebrating the first year opening the anniversary of the coffee shop opening there, Breeze Barista Bar, and it was a real hive of activity, unbelievable on the day. And recently I brought people there from from Limerick and Kerry, and they said if this was in Killarney, there would be coaches lined up in the in the car park. And uh, so really I, I want is it an, is it an academic thing? that Gorton Glen Forest Park is not identified as a visitor attraction on the list of council tourism attractions, because in reality it is that, it has become that, and it's no accident, I mean, the council can claim much of the credit, the lion's share of the credit, this was planned for and resourced, but which other visitor attractions have larger footfalls, and should Gorton Glen Forest Park not be listed and described as a visitor attraction? That's my real question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Michael Duff and Councillor Eamon Keane. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, uh, I'd like to second um, Councillor Michael Ayer's proposal uh, to proceed without the inclusion of the quote about uh, growth. Um, I think as Ahmed has outlined, growth and uh, the unending search for growth uh, a lot of times comes at great cost to the environment. Uh, to our community and to uh, a lot of other factors. So, yeah, thank you, Chair. Okay. That's all the speakers at this point. Um, Kim? Thank Chair? You. It's not all the speakers. Sorry. Oh. Maybe you haven't seen me. Man, Bert, your hand just isn't up there. I'll see it now. Hold on. We'll let Kim in here now. Hold on a wee second, no, Bert. No, just... no problem. Thank, thank you, Chair. So, uh... In terms of the reference to inclusive growth and the inclusion of businesses, I think we felt that the, re the lack of specific reference to businesses didn't reflect the VICE model, which is about visitor, industry, community and the environment. And in terms of inclusive growth, um, I suppose the definition of, of inclusive growth is, is really about not, not about unlimited growth, but about a growth that's distributed fairly across society, which is why we've included the term inclusive growth. And the VDP does uh, aim to generate growth, but not in unlimited visitor numbers and not in a way that impacts uh, on our environment, but the growth that brings benefits and growth which would be aimed at, for example, increasing the length of visitor stay. So it's not about bringing coach loads of visitors to, uh, you know, delicate environments that can't handle it or, or to communities where the infrastructure is not able to cope with those levels of numbers. It's about increasing visitor stay and increasing visitor spend. So, you know, to, to derive greater benefit in the district from the tourism industry, we do need growth, uh, but we need growth that is inclusive, that's shared, that's spread equitably. So uh, I suppose I would recommend that that, that is, is encompassed within our vision statement. Um, in terms of Gorton Glen's Forest Park, um, I suppose it's not, at, at the moment, it's not a visitor facility as, in terms of the other visitor facilities that we have, but it's something that we do need to encompass now within the VDP and within how we, and in terms of how we look at our own facilities within the council, and that will be something that we'll pick up in our own internal review. 
we do recognise that our numbers are uh, demonstrating that it is, if not the most, one of the highest uh, uh, visited places that we have we have in the district. Um, uh, and so that is something that we do need to pick up in terms of our own our own internal arrangements. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Warrington. I just want to second uh, Councillor Thompson's uh, proposal for the recommendations. Thank you. Councillor I go, Councillor Wilson, yep, go ahead. Yes. Well, I was just going to second that, but um, yes, well, you know, we are Fermanagh and Oma. Fermanagh have got a natural beauty and a natural attraction in their lakes. Uh, over the years, uh, in my time and all along, uh, we had the Garden Lens uh, Forest Park was really the attraction that was in the Oma end of the, the uh, uh, council area and the the attraction and the and the money that are spent building it up to what it is uh, at this minute in time is really uh, to be welcomed uh, it has uh, you know the, the attraction i've been down as, as say i chaired the committee for a while down there and the the, the uh, attraction that is bringing uh, drawing people for miles and miles and miles and i would uh, I agree with what uh, uh, Councillor Michael Duff said there about uh, the attraction that it was in comparison with what uh, down south somewhere, but uh, it really uh, needs uh, it needs more uh, support, I suppose, and uh, expansion because it's, it's the only it and the Spurns are really the only attraction that is in this end of uh, our uh, realistic council. And uh, I think it's great to have it. I think it's great to see it. And I have no problem supporting uh, the uh, proposal. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor O'Coffey. Sorry, I was just. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I, first of all, I want to say it's a good report. I think there's a lot of work's gone into it. And I want to thank those who've put their such effort into making this such a report. Um, before I go on, I, I, in terms of the inclusive growth arguments, uh, I would tend to agree with the, the line that was given there by the director, and I would just ask that that would be made explicit within the document that we're seeking a form of inclusive growth, which is to the benefit of all, because I think that is something that's important. Equally, I think it's important that we don't see um, it all about spend per night, because we're in an environment where people are huge, under huge pressures, and uh, I think it is incumbent upon us to provide tourism activities for the, our own people in our own area, because yeah. it's an exploration that all of us can do. Um, and I think it's very good that we as a council have uh, taken such a proactive role in uh, developing uh, tourism attractions in our area. The fact that it is a local authority that owns for example, the Broadwalk, uh, the uh, the Marble Arch Caves, the Castle, um, and and then the, the attractions in 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 Tyrone that's been referenced earlier on. The, these are major attractions, um, and we we have things like the Mount Drum uh, archaeological site, which I think is very uh, significant and could become a part of an attraction. So I, it's good that in the context of market failure. Uh, which is what we have had, and a lack of investment by central government for decades, that this council has taken a, a proactive role. And I think that's all to be welcomed. I, I also want to specifically welcome uh, in the report uh, the recommendation around a megalithic and archaeological site trail, which I, is something certainly to my heart, I think that we do not make anywhere near enough of uh, the incredible archaeological wealth that is around all of our areas. Uh, equally, the dark skies concept, which is referenced here, it's worth defending. It's not something that we can uh, undermine. Uh, and I think it's something that we could really make a lot more of in terms of attracting tourists to all parts, uh, especially rural areas uh, in both east and west, uh, who would uh, have a lot to offer in terms of dark skies. Um, the, the final point really is around, uh, there's a lot of reform talked about in, in terms of structural reform. Uh, is there any indication whether there, like, does this uh, preclude uh, an analysis of a role going forward for the likes of Manor Lakeland Tourism, 
or is it possible that perhaps we're looking at an alternative delivery model? That's something um, I would like to have more information on. There's a lot of issues being raised in the consultation, which I think the director touched upon. Um, for example, the difference between regenerative and sustainable tourism, which I do think should be uh, de developed. And in particular, I think there was a reference there to dark skies in relation to that. And finally, the point uh, is we've got tremendous lakes um, as well as natural environment, but in, in the Fermanagh side of things, the Lohern uh, experience is uh, almost second to none. But the problem we have, as is recognized both uh, in, certainly in the comments that I, I've read in terms of the consultation response, is that we are really undermining that through the chronic underinvestment that is coming uh, in terms of combined sewer outlets and water infrastructure which is literally meaning that we're encouraging on one hand people to have water sports in and around the very site we're meeting tonight and at the same time we are well aware of uh, ongoing and only this weekend we can think of that uh, ongoing spillages of surge into the water and that's what people are being encouraged to get into so i think so that's something we need to look at if we're going to be serious about this thank you chair do you consider feeling yeah thank you chair and thanks to kim and the team for the for the all the work they've done on this and i would be happy enough with the recommendation there and make the support it and i know and i said this before the day we had that we were, had this before but we have great potential around here like we've all the and Donald Turk, some of there, Loch Erne, Loch Melvin, Loch McNean, all the wee foresty logs up to the foresty there in the forest day for people fishing and all that, you know. So we've great potential and we're in the geo park there. But I do, I can see where, where Emmett was coming from there, like, but maybe overdoing it too much, like a wee bit there. I seen up at the, in the start up at the board, at the boardwalk there where there's, there's serious problems with parking and all that there. And maybe too many people come, which, you think that's a, a a good thing? What was kind of a bad thing in the start? But all that would be got sorted out and got ironed out through time, you know. And it's not as bad now. Like, and thank you, Kim. You explained it very well about the inclusive growth, as growth for all. And I think if we had that, I wasn't that sure what it meant to, but you explained it very well there. And I would be um happy enough with the recommendation to support it as it is. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Anthony. Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. And at the outset, Chair, I would like to thank. Uh, Kim for her report and for the team that produced this document. Chair, I think it's an absolutely wonderful document and uh, it's so beautifully presented. Even the photography is absolutely stunning. And, and, and speaking for my own neck of the woods, the photographs of the Gorchin Lakes and the Gorchin Glen Forest Parks, as well as the waterways in Fermanagh, the photography is absolutely stunning. But the contents of the report make perfect sense to me, Chair. And I know that in our previous mandate, um, there was a lot of concern uh, within uh, the Council at that time that we were not making enough of our tourism product, particularly on the OMA side. And we felt very much that uh, the Gorchin Glens and the Sperrins were not uh, being exploited fully for the economic benefits uh, that they can bring. And I think that this report shows that this council has knuckled down and addressed those issues. I think that tourism has the potential to really uh, add to our economic growth and the livelihoods of people who can uh, use tourism uh, um, for expanding their businesses, for innovation. We have already seen it um, in our district council area, how innovative people can be uh, with little uh, coffee stops and so on. And it's it's just wonderful to see all those, all those developments. And also, I think that in today's um, uncertain uh, uh, climate change crisis, cost of living crisis, all of these things, People will be wanting to remain closer to home uh, for their holidays and recreation. And I think the fact that we are developing our tourism product and bringing out the best in what we've got uh, is very much to be commended. And I think that this uh, piece of work uh, does do that. Of course, we are concerned, Chair, about potential environmental damage from tourist sites being overutilized. But 
I think that with the, with the proper facilities being put in place, that that damage to an, our environment will be minimal. Or uh, if it occurs, as with the the boardwalk, the stairway to heaven, that that you know we can mitigate it going forward. So I'm just happy to support the recommendation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> and Councillor Baird. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's just an administrative point under item three. I declared an interest in this, and that was in relation to my membership of Fermanagh uh, FLT. But having listened and reread the papers there, I don't see a, a, a conflict of interest now. There probably will be next month when we come to the governance. So I want to withdraw my declaration of interest. Okay. Members, we've had it proposed and seconded. We've had two proposals, actually. Sorry, Kim. Yeah, go ahead. Just, there was just one query from Councillor Coffey around the structural reform issue, and does that include the role of FLTs? Just to confirm that, yes, that uh, review that we're undertaking looks both at how we do tourism internally, but also externally and our relationships with um, others, including FLT. Uh, and that will be encompassed in the report next month. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McAleer, your proposal was the first one that was seconded, um, that we remove inclusive growth um, from from that statement. Is that correct? To clarify, it was to remove the word growth as opposed to inclusive growth. Um, so I'm, I would like to stick to that because I do have concerns about anywhere that word growth is used in terms of the economy. But I would be very supportive of Councillor Coffey's notion or proposal that whatever way the vote goes, that sub, there are other uh, terms being defined uh, within the report. So if my proposal is defeated, I would very much like to see the definition of inclusive growth as laid out by the director included within the report. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members, uh, we're well agreed on that. On Councillor McAleer's proposal to remove growth. Okay. Um, I don't think we need to go to recorded vote. Members, can those in favour just raise their hand? In favour of Councillor McAleer's proposals, right? Is there anybody? And Councillor Keenan seconded, so... That's two. Okay, members, so that's defeated. So now we'll go to Councillor Thompson's proposal, which was seconded by Councillor Warrington, which was the uh, the recommendations as listed. Are we all agreed? And um, uh, those objecting to that, Councillor McAleer um, and Councillor Keenan. Councillor Wilson, your hand's up there just. It's down again now, right now. Okay, members, that's passed. What's that? What's the two, two objections? Okay, thank you. Um, 6.5 members is to consider report of Director of Regeneration and Planning. Kim, thank you. Okay, so th this report covers a number of items. Firstly, letters of offer and letters of variance, which are as outlined at section 2.1. At 2.2, just to note the Peace Plus consultation, which is ongoing to, to inform the development of a local peace action plan. Appendix 1 outlines those events and just to encourage members to... Um, uh, share those within your networks and encourage attendance where possible. 2.3 relates to the Royal Town Planning Institute Awards for Planning Excellence and members will recall that Gorchen Glen Forest Park did receive, was successful in the Northern Ireland Awards. It has now gone through to the um, national awards and there is a ceremony, an award ceremony in London on the 30th of November. Uh, it's proposed that Council does not attend th that awards event given our current financial uh, implications. Um, the fourth item relates to a piece of artwork developed through the LAG uh, Action Group under the Cooperation Scheme. It's uh, in relation to the International Appalachian Trail. That artwork is currently in situ in uh, the Ulster American Folk Park um, and it's recommended now that we just formalise that process by the transfer of title to National Museums Northern Ireland and approve sign-off by the Chief Executive. The fifth item then relates to the COVID Recovery Small Settlements Regeneration Programme. Members will recall they've previously agreed that that uh, action plan, which was approved by the three government departments, includes four distinct elements. Three of those elements are currently being delivered. The fourth item then related to a site frontage scheme. Uh, and we previously agreed uh, through Council in May that that site frontage scheme would focus on two settlements to try and maximise the impact. 
Um, we've now done some analysis and the two identified settlements are Newton Butler and Six Mile Cross. Um, scheme will open shortly, uh, subject to agreement for applications from eligible property owners and lease owners uh, to revitalise derelict commercial properties and gap sites up to a maximum value, a grant value of £1,000 at a rate of 90% per project with 10% match funding from the applicant. Uh, to, to support activities such as power washing, painting, signage, guttering and down pipes, shop front improvements and screening of gap sites. Uh, so the recommendations are as outlined that we note the acceptance of the letters of offer and letters of variance. We note the update on the Peace Plus consultation. We don't send any representatives to the RTPI awards event in London on the 30th of November. Approved transfer of title of the murmuration artwork from FODC to National Museums NI and agree that the site frontage scheme is targeted at properties in the Newton Butler and Six Mile Cross settlements. Thank you. Councillor Willers. Gura Margaret Carley, uh, thank you Chair and thanks to Kim for the report. I think it's an extremely positive report with lots of good news for our community so I'm happy to propose the recommendations. Um, some good uh, Positive announcements there from the PHA um, with their support for several of the health programs in the area, including the contribution towards the fuel poverty scheme. We've already spoken regularly, I think, on the impact that the increase in fuel costs have on people in this chamber. Um, and I've even seen the growth in membership of an oil club involved in mid in recent months. So that can need to grow. So we need to see more mitigation for the costs that people are facing. I would just have a query there on um, when will the fuel poverty scheme be administered and how will it be administered? Um, and 2.3 there, the Gorchin Land Forest Park, been shortlisted for that excellence in planning for health and wellbeing award. As referred to earlier by Councillor Magaldoff, there's some great work been done there by um, all of the council staff and developed on that venue, so um, well done to them as well. The site frontage scheme then, and uh, is in, that includes Six Mile Cross and my own DA, so that's a welcome investment that'll help revitalise properties in the village. And again, I have a question on that is, um, when details in the scheme will be published and um, when will applications be opened. And then finally, as um, Kim alluded to the earlier there, I'd like to encourage people to attend the remaining Peace Plus consultations. Um, it's a great opportunity for local people to get involved and get their uh, communities prioritised in the new programme. So I uh, encourage people to go to that as well. Graham Thank you. That's mine, Kim. Well, just to note that... Um John might want to comment on the fuel poverty scheme, but in terms of the site frontage, if we get approval tonight to, to work with those two settlements, we'll open that scheme as, as soon as possible. And I'll share the, the dates with members in terms of the um, arrangements for opening the call. Thank you. John? Yes, Chair, just in relation to the award of £12,000 for the fuel poverty scheme, this is a, a figure or an amount of money that we get each year from the PHA in relation to programmes, not necessarily, and it, it isn't in relation to giving out money to residents in, in relation to fuel poverty. It is uh, for programmes um, such as the energy workshops and, and various things in provision of information um, uh, to do uh, energy assessments. Uh, I think we have 180 or just over 180 energy assessments to do to do out of that and also to, to run slow cooker events uh, as part of the programme. Um, uh, one of one of the things in the in the fuel poverty scheme is that you cannot be part of a neighbourhood renewal area. So it's it's in the rural areas is, is where this takes place largely, um, and it is very much aligned to the affordable warm scheme. Um, and the 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 real benefit of it is that it assesses officers can go into go, in, go into homes and can assess. And, and where needs aren't met through the affordable warm or whatever can identify other funding streams in order to, to, to help people. So in that sense, the £12,000 is not an awful lot of money from the PHA, but it's actually used as a leverage for, for further funds, uh, which, uh, which we help uh, residents apply for. Thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. And uh, yeah, I'll start by second uh, the recommendations as noted, and again, thanking the the director who answered uh, a real list of queries I had in relation to the various points raised on that. Definitely, uh, like previous speakers, I would welcome the COVID recovery small settlements uh, regeneration program and the site settlement scheme, both in Newton Butler and particularly in Six Mile Cross and Mid Tyrone here. 
I'm sure there are undoubtedly many other areas across the district council area disappointed to have missed out, but it is encouraging that these two areas have now been confirmed. And again, as noted in the report, that the, the allocation of funds has actually increased since originally allocated. I think, again, the important next step is getting a message out there to encourage engagement and to pick up on this and now increased fund. And again, maybe if, if Patrick was amenable, that we would look to holding some sort of engagement in the two villages noted, um, because I think that face-to-face -face, uh, aspect is still a good way as any to promote the, the fact that we do have this funding available. And again, that it is refined to these two areas, it, it should hopefully be something that, that is uh, doable. Again, just working through the, the letters of notice, um, I suppose initial take, I had thought it was going to be uh, a donation towards uh, a fuel scheme. Uh, unfortunately, it's not, but I appreciate what has been outlined uh, in the response to me and again by the, the director tonight. The physical activity referral scheme, another hugely important thing and something that we should be encouraging. Um, and again, the the marine uh, grant, the marine litter grant, which is enabling uh, water refill stations at a number of sites across the district and litter picking stations across the district is something that we have been working on, I suppose, as a council and something that is very encouraging news. And to note again that the, the Gorching Glen site is something that's going to benefit from both of these is definitely good news for, for Mid uh, and there are other areas across Oma and Enniskill that, that stand to uh, benefit as well and Belcoo there as well. So just uh, very pleased with, with what's been brought forward and happy enough to second as noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, Chair. You'll be glad to know that I'm not going to repeat everything that's in, in the document, but uh, I agree with a lot of what has been said by the two speakers. Uh, just with regard to a query Councillor McAleer had about the face-to-face -face meetings, uh, that has always been the case from my memory, going back to 2010, so I don't see why it would be the case as we move forward. But I'm happy to propose, or happy to support the recommendations as listed, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stephen Donnelly. No, thank you, Chair. I mean, uh, likewise, I just uh, want to support um, the comments by Councillor McAleer that I think it is important that actually that on the ground engagement does take place to make sure that actually the benefits that the scheme uh, presents for both Newton Butler and Six Mile Crest can be fully realized because I think that this can be genuinely transformative even though it's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a small amount of money but I think it can have a real big difference just in terms of revitalizing the public image of both uh, Six Mile Cross and Newton Butler making sure that it has a more livelier kind of more vibrant and more cleanly uh, image and hopefully in due course we'll have the opportunity to be able to further advance similar schemes uh, in, in different contexts uh, to different villages and rural areas across the district. Thank you Chair. Thank you Councillor Donnelly and Councillor Philip. Thank you Chair. Yeah just like to welcome this report as well and the letters of office especially the one for the, the culture lakelands there as well. Good to see it. No, I was just coming on the, on the Peace Plus consultations as well. I was at one in Belgium myself there, I think it was on the 18th of October. I see that there's been four already to date. There was two at seven o'clock in the evening, there's two at midday. I was wondering to came to came know has the has the been middle crowds going to them? Is the ones at midday are the smaller than the ones in the evening or, she, or does she know? I just just wondering from your own because I think um I was at the one in the evening and it wasn't that fierce big of a crowd at it. So I was just wondering what is there any difference between them? Do you have that information, Kim? I don't have the actual numbers, but I know that it's challenging to get people to come to any of these in-person consultation events. We did want to give the opportunity, and we have varied times so that people can pick the time that suits them, but we have supplemented them with online events as well to try and maximise engagement. Thank you. Councillor Keenan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd like to also let me support to the recommendations and um, some very worthwhile projects. Um, just on the point of the Appalachian, Appalachian art piece, um, um, it's not too often uh, the subject of art comes up, but I have been made aware of uh, there's a similar or there's an opportunity coming to our area in January 2023 with an art roadshow display. And uh, this display has been done by a uh, Palestinian um, interfaith group. And uh, there, like, there's 12 pieces of art within it and uh, very interesting stuff. And I'd like to propose maybe, if possible, that we as a council could provide um, some of our buildings in the area to showcase this, this, this uh, art roadshow. Um, thank you, Chair. 
Okay, Councillor Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to also lend my support to the recommendations, and I wanted to pick up on a point Kim made about the Peace Plus um, consultations, and also encourage everyone to share them. I have been seeing um, various uh, the the wee graphic there that uh, that um, on decision time has been. I've seen it about social media, but I did want to ask Kim: um, Has the Peace Plus consultation events uh, been advertised anywhere else other than social media? I know those are the bit of a discussion at the start of the meeting uh, around um, not everyone has access to social media. So how else ha have these been advertised? Thank you. Thank you. They've been advertised in local newspapers and they've also been, um, the information has also been shared through our community support networks um, uh, and newsletters uh, to try and encourage uh, participation and also through all of the representatives on the Peace Plus Partnership. Thank you, Kim. Councillor Anne Marie Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. And I would just like to a bit of clarification on item 2.5, the site frontage scheme. Um, well, it was brilliant that there's an opportunity for Newton Butler and Six Mile Cross um, business owners and vacant owners of vacant properties to apply for funding. What happens if there's an underspend? Um, Forgive me if I've discussed this before, but it hasn't come to my mind here when I'm looking at it. Is there an opportunity that should there be an underspend that this could be rolled out then to another identified area within the district? Because I'm assuming that this is time bound, this spend, if it's within the small settlement scheme. Perhaps um, Kim could maybe clarify. Thank you. Again, we'd have to discuss with the funders any variation to the, the spend in terms of the plan that has been agreed. Um, there may be opportunities if there is an underspend uh, to direct it to some of the other three elements of the original programme if, if we identify that there are funding pressures coming to bear on, on any of those. So it's something we'd have to discuss with the funders um, in terms of the be best use. We would hope that given the number of properties there are in both Six Mile Cross and Newton Butler that that um, have been identified as vacant. That hopefully we would we would secure you know a good level of uptake. That's great, Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Reilly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I first of all uh, welcome uh, this report and and certainly the uh, scheme for Six Mile Cross and for Newton Butler. And while I welcome that, I want to uh, add uh, to hopefully try to encourage that as we have a, um, a system to encourage as many people, because sometimes these properties are not owned by local people in and around the villages, that they're owned from people that live uh, some distances away and uh, bought by developers and so forth. And also the gap sites fall into that as well. So there, this is a relatively small amount of money when split between the two villages for all of the properties that uh, could do with this. But moreover, Chair, while I welcome this, and of course it's it's good to uh, to get something to be able to try to improve the appearances of these villages, that does not substitute for inward investment into these villages. These villages are struggling to stay alive. We talked many years in this council about dormant villages where really and truly all it was was some place to come home and sleep. And we see where a lot of our villages are declining year on year with the closure of businesses and everything else. So I would call here, Chair, that while I welcome this, that we would have uh, more of a plan to try to uh, encourage growth, encourage development of, of business in these. Uh, I take the example of my own village, Newton Butler, where there is not a development units in the village to be able to encourage that uh, organic growth of business. And I think that is the key uh, to, to improving our villages in the long term. And Chair, just to add one other, that we have numbers of different agencies uh, that have a role uh, in our villages in one way or another. And I focus uh, particularly on the likes of uh, the road service, 
uh, where they have not just a remit about putting tar in potholes, but by improving infrastructure that improves the overall appearance of a town or a village. And I think it's very important that we would have some sort of, and I would propose that we would have some sort of um, liaison group of some description to be able to try to uh, put a little bit of pressure on these outside agencies that they would actually respond when asked to improve infrastructure that is either broken or neglected, that they actually take a, a cognizance of that and their responsibility to the overall improvements and appearance of our towns and villages. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Councillor O'Reilly. Got the comments noted from Councillor O'Reilly. Thank you. Councillor McAleer. Thanks, Chair. I appreciate you. Let me in a second time, but it's just really to um, tidy up there, and I'm happy enough to second the, the proposal by Councillor O'Reilly there. I think it is uh, an extremely helpful and, and an important one. And also the proposal from Councillor Keenan that we investigate this group of uh, Palestinian artists and see how we can accommodate them through the Council. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we've had that um, report proposed and seconded. We have a separate proposal there by Councillor Keenan, seconded by Councillor McAleer. And also there was a proposal by Councillor O'Reilly, and that's been seconded. Are members content that with relation to that proposal from Councillor Keenan, uh, would we need some more information on that before us to, and then we could, jo John, do you want a word on that? Or? Yeah, yeah, Chair, and certainly before we, we, we start looking at, at uh, you know, the, the proposal, we would certainly need details about, uh, about what the, the, the show is about or, or what the art that is being presented. Uh, is about uh, so certainly more details before we would do any work on it. Well, we'll leave it on that basis. If Councillor Keenan can contact the director with the appropriate information, yeah, I'm the chair. Yeah, I'll be happy to pass all the information on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. But thank you, Chair. Well, we we'll wait for their detail uh, from Councillor Keenan to our director John Boyle here on that matter. Uh, that could, in my mind, what he is proposing at this moment in time, what I'm hearing from him, could be very divisive. So uh, we'll see what comes back from Councillor Keenan to our director, and we'll make our decision then on that one. Thank you. Okay, members, we'll move on to the reports now, uh, item 7, Regeneration Plan and Director Report 7.1. These are for noting members to note report on the Census 2021 results. Um, we can move to the recommendation on that, members. Um, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. No, it's fairly straightforward this one, so I'm happy enough to note this. And again, just in Appendix 1, that we're becoming a, a more ethnically diverse district area is encouraging you, so happy enough to re support the note. Thank you. Thank you. And a seconder, please, Councillor yeah, Donnelly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hold on, Councillor Wilson, Councillor Donnelly, right. Stephen Donnelly. Okay. No, uh, happy to second, Chair. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that the overwhelming message from this is that we are becoming a more diverse society and we need to adjust accordingly to make sure that that's fully facilitated in the way that we conduct our business. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you. I was going to second it. Uh, I'm glad to note that the uh, population of Anniskillen has dropped by 100 as the organisers of the tidy towns had wanted to upgrade us to a large town, but having a population reduction actually keeps us safe in the medium town category again. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. Yes, Chair. Well, I, I welcome this document as well. And in fact, it uh, just uh, proves that some of the things I have been uh, saying are not just uh, pie in the sky. Uh, for instance, in our own council area, 96% of the population speak uh, English. 4% uh, other languages, and that would include uh, Polish, uh, Irish, and Lithuanian. So. At least 98% of the, the population in our area speak uh, English, and uh, we are quite happy now to go ahead and squander millions of pounds on uh, uh, erecting political road signs. Thank you. Okay, this screen, sorry members, has, uh, has left me. Uh, Councillor Keenan, were you on that issue or was it from before? Sorry, your hand's still raised. From before, sir. Oh, sorry. Okay, members. I think that's um, proposed and seconded, and we'll move on to 7.2.
is to note report on unadopted estates and land slippage and the potential accountability which may occur, including the roles and responsibilities of various regulatory services. This is for noting as well. Members, if we can move to the recommendation, please. Councillor Wilson. Uh, Chair, no, I just uh, mistook that. No, I didn't. I'm quite all right. Thank you. Sorry, is there anybody just to propose the, the note? Councillor Dehan? Propose the note, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And a seconder? Oh, Chair, I'll second that. There we are. Proposed and seconded, members. Thank you. We'll move on to 7 3 now as to note update report on various economic development initiatives. And uh, if we could have a proposer, please, members, for that. Councillor Stephen Donnelly and Councillor Victor Warrington to second. Thank you, members. Councillor O'Kitty. Right. Um, correspondence now, members. 8.1, item 5.1.3 is correspondence dated the 10th of October from the Minister of Infrastructure uh, regarding levelling up funding. Kim? Yeah, this is in response to our representations um, in terms of an update on the Enskill and Southern Relief Bypass and also clarification on the funding package and whether uh, an application had been submitted to the Leveling Up Fund. So the, the scheme is well progressed uh, in terms of, of readiness. Uh, an application has been made to the Leveling Up Fund for the project and the department has also applied to the New Deal for Northern Ireland for funding and awaits the outcome of both applications. Councillor McElduff. Sorry about that, Mark. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Just a proposal to note, please, members. Okay. Uh, this this item, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Swift, to second. Thank you. Uh, we'll take. We've already dealt with eight two members. Eight three. I think we can take eight three one and eight three two together. It's correspondence dated the eleventh of October from the Minister um, of the Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs regarding the cost of living crisis, and also correspondence of the seventeenth of October from the Minister for the Economy. Um, both for note members, Councillor McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, obviously, this I'll propose to note to begin with, but uh, this is obviously in response to uh, a previous motion taken by this council and uh, communications issued. But it's interesting that the the response from the two the two ministers uh, in question they remain defiantly content to ignore the content of the letter and the motion that was actually passed. Um, they're keeping their heads in the sands in relation to the suffering of the people right across this district and beyond. And I suppose the the idea that a minister is sitting on an annual salary for this current financial year of £89,500, perhaps they're not experiencing the same pressures of the rest of society. So I'm wondering, and if it's possible, I would propose that we as a council uh, should encourage that maybe those that are taking a salary but aren't doing what they're elected to do questions should be raised about that if they're abdicating their responsibilities some action should be taken if if council could do it i think we should actually contact either the secretary of state the nio or the relevant westminster departments to see about ceasing payments to elected stormont representatives who refuse to do their job because that's what these gentlemen are doing. And I would make that as a proposal, Chair. Okay, that's your proposal. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, I'll second the noting, but I'll not agree with anything else he's just said. Uh, there, there are reasons uh, why people are not in their posts and they're well documented right across these islands. Uh, it's interesting to note that there was another party across the way from me here and, and they were out of government and the same call wasn't made by the same councillor. So, well, we'll not take any lectures in that way. So, uh, I'm happy to second the noting of the correspondence, Chair. Thank you. The two pieces of correspondence noted, members. Uh, councillor Swift. I'm happy to second Emmett's proposal. Thank you. And Councillor Gannon. Just very brief, Chair. Everything Councillor Thompson has said is uh, excuses. Um, just the need to go back to work, all of them. Thank you. Okay, members. Uh, Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to basically just say that the second piece of correspondence from the Minister of Economy was was perhaps the most disappointing response this council's ever received. Um, he may as well have not responded at all. Um, 
But the other thing I, I, I want to say is ugh, I, I do think Councillor McAleer's proposal is a little bit ridiculous, to be honest. And I'm sure I'll make a nice tweet for him, but if we even get a reply from the people he's proposed writing to, it'll be very surprising. Thank you. Okay, and the last speaker, members, Councillor Keenan. I fully support uh, Emmett's proposal. I think it's a valid point, and I think the majority of the people in the community would also support it. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, Councillor McGuire, are you very quick, just please? Here we go, sir. Uh, well, just on the back of that uh, proposal about the, the money, etc., I, I, I'm sure it will make a tweet, and uh, maybe we should send a letter to Stephen Nolan as well in relation to it, because that's where the the level of that debate belongs as far as i'm concerned uh, it does nothing to progress the uh, political impasse that we're caught in and uh, as we have always advocated it is the responsibility of the dup to get back in there and to get some form of government up and running so that we can start to progress uh, with the cost of living crisis and other issues that are real issues out there but uh, as regards uh, just a, a populist notion of cutting wages, I, I, I don't think I'd be supportive of that, Gorman Good Chair. Okay, members, I don't think there's anyone against the noting of the two pieces. Um, we do have that proposal from Councillor McAleer, seconded by Councillor Swift. Um, I sense that there's dissent in that, um, member, so I think we'll just... We'll put, yes, you seconded the note. Yeah. We'll put Councillor McAleer's proposal to the floor. Councillor Warrington? Just all I was going to say was at the end of the day, uh, as a party, we will certainly be uh, against Councillor McAleer's proposal, but it's already been voiced out there. The Secretary of State has already been uh, voiced that he is looking at MLA's uh, and Minister's wages. So, as, as has already been alluded to, uh, it will make uh, headlines, I suppose. Thank you. Okay. That's been recorded, members, so if we can set that up, please, IT, thank you. Is it on this issue, Stephen, or uh, very, very quick, just please, we've gone to the vote. So. Yeah, Chair, I mean, just on this issue, I mean, I think that ultimately, I mean, if you're not doing the full job, then you shouldn't be receiving the full pay, so ultimately I'm sympathetic with uh, that element being put forward, so I don't think there's anything controversial there. Okay, I think the vote is um, about to start, members, in the chamber, and... Thank you. Thank you, members, for their, your, your patience there. We'll just, Kim will give us the results now. Okay, members, so that's seven for, 13 against, and one abstention. Okay, so the proposal falls, members. So move on to 8.4. It's to note correspondence dated the 26th of October from DFI regarding St. Lucia's site in OMA. Um, and we'll go just to Councillor Deehan, that's just for noting. Yes, Chair, uh, uh, I uh, would like to propose to note this correspondence. But Chair, you know, um, in the OMA place shaping plan, uh, 
there was reference made to the St. Lucia site and what a valuable site this is and potentially how it could add considerably to the county town of Tyrone, which is Oma. Um, I think this letter reference, references um, the, the poor condition of the buildings, the potential contamination of the site, maintenance cost, present market conditions and an extremely unpredictable economy. Unfortunately, uh, th that particular situation has not arisen overnight. This property has been lying vacant and deteriorating uh, for over 15 years. And uh, unfortunately, this letter doesn't uh, reassure me uh, that there's going to be any uh, action on the transfer of the St. Lucia site anytime soon um, to the, de uh, the Department for Infrastructure. I mean, the letter does uh, make reference to uh, the extension of our Riverside Walk and the Council developing a feasibility study. If we could find a discrete section of the site, which would not jeopardise any future developments. I mean, I don't know how we can identify uh, uh, a discrete portion of the site if we don't really know what the future development plans uh, are. So whilst I note uh, this report, I'm disappointed and I would like to propose that this council continue uh, to uh, communicate uh, with DFI and also uh, with um, the MOD regarding this site and how uh, it, it is important that we should progress this issue. We do have considerable public interest in our his historical buildings and uh, a new community group has been um, formed, you know, to look at the condition of these buildings, including the governor's house on Jail Square. So I think um, as a council, we need to be very proactive uh, because if we are not, then uh, we will lose an opportunity which has the potential to bring uh, great benefits uh, to, to our town. So I propose we uh, write back, Chair, to DFI and also to the MOD, just expressing our concerns and uh, asking for these decisions to be progressed uh, with some haste. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Montlockery. Thank you, Chair. I uh, tend to agree with what, most of what Councillor Deacon has said uh, in, in noting this correspondence. I think it's an absolute disgrace that the, the site has been left the way it was left. When this, this site was in use almost 20 years ago and was a, in a reasonable set of, set of repair, it has two unique buildings off the square at St Lucia, which is the hospital building and the officer's mess. It has other fine uh, 19th century buildings there. It also had two high quality sports fields, one rugby pitch and one soccer pitch, which were of the highest quality. And all that is just left in ruin. And to see us at this stage now, almost 20 years later, and it still hasn't been put to use, I think it, it is a disgrace for the, the authorities that have been responsibility for looking after it, <laughs> that they've allowed this to carry on for this length of time. Councillor Hillier. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm supportive of the, the previous speakers, and um, I think Councillor McLaughlin noted the, the letter. I'm not sure if he seconded Councillor Dehan's proposal. If not, I'm happy to do so. I think the, the note within the letter that MOD has confirmed that no funding will transfer with the land, which would result in DFA becoming liable for all costs incurred, when, as we all know, no matter what the cost of living crisis or what the, the next crisis is going to be, Defence, and I use that in, in inverted commas, defence is always the one that never seems to suffer any budget recounts. So I think uh, in relation to, to that, that's hugely disappointing and I am fully supportive of going back to to see what can be done in relation to that. Uh, Councillor Dehan also referred when she was speaking there about the, the new group in OMA, Save OMA GL. Um, I'd actually like to propose that we as a council, through the officers, investigate the the prospect of having an informal meeting with this group, um, subject to obviously them meeting requirements and that. But the as as was referred to, yeah, the, the story of the governor's house um on the route to St. Lucia Barracks, uh, which is a unique 
B1 listed eight-sided building and designed by the same architect who designed the courthouse and built the courthouse in Oma is, is a fascinating one uh, and it is, uh, as previous speakers have said, a, a very unique building. It's a unique piece of history and I think it is one that, that needs to be preserved and looked after. So um, I would make that just as a further proposal, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sir Thompson. Well, thank you, Chair. And uh, I do support the comments of uh, Councillor Dehan and Councillor McClary uh, on this issue. It is certainly a disappointing uh, reply. Uh, the buildings, or the building, the buildings themselves, were closed in two thousand and seven. That's how long ago it is. For those who didn't know that, uh, the buildings within the core square were probably pointed around the years of 2004-2005. The outside would be fairly good condition, most of them, but the insides, obviously, because of the closure and the switching off of heat and electricity and everything else, have basically fallen apart inside. So we all know the history of it. We all know what the state of it is inside. So, I mean, uh, to say it, you're just going to basically leave it there, <laughs> for the foreseeable is not acceptable to any person coming from this district, never mind the county town of Tyrone, which is Oma. Just with regard to uh, Councillor McAleer's uh, proposal to have a, a meeting with the, the group involved with the, the Governor's House, I have no issue with that. Uh, it's part of the historic Oma. The jail square is part of the historic Oma, next to St Lucia Barracks, and it is a very historic piece. As, as he's referred to also the courthouse here as well. So I'm happy if nobody else is second. I'm second. I'd second that we do have a formal meeting with them just to tease out uh, what they're actually uh, wanting to uh, to get across to us. So let's go on. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor. Councillor Michael Duff. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just to note that other heritage groups have developed and they're developing locally. One of them is called Duchas Hiron and it's Tyrone's Heritage and it's focused on the Gaelic history of the place. So I look forward to engagement with them as well in the future. But in relation, I think there's one small positive in it. We're not making much progress at this time in the long-term strategic use of the site, and we want to, we want to, we're anxious to do that. But whenever we met John O'Dowd several weeks ago, uh, John O'Dowd was very honest and he said, between now and the 28th of October, I have seven weeks, seven weeks, he said, uh, in my role as caretaker minister. So we zoned in on the minister that day and we did ask him to help us progress uh, the extension of the existing Riverside Walk. So I'm going to propose that the council um, scope out uh, developing a feasibility study on securing a discrete section of the site which wouldn't jeopardize any future development. And uh, examine how that can be achieved, you know, linkage with the Derry Road. That extension of the Riverside Walk would be very, very positive. You know, uh, an early win, if we can get it, while we're pursuing the longer strategic objective. Now, also, Emma Stockman here points us towards the blue-green budget within uh, DFA and said, if such a Riverside Walk scheme came forward, then we could qualify for significant support from that budget allocation there under the blue-green budget of the department. So I think there's something there worth exploring in the immediacy of the here and now, as well as uh, looking at the longer-term strategic development of the site, which is so important for the town. So I'm making a proposal that we explore that uh, feasibility study. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And Councillor Bayer. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I agree with a lot of the comments uh, made by well, my own colleagues, uh, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Day, and Councillor Michael Duff, and as well as my party colleague, uh, Councillor McLaughery. Um, con uh, Errol hit it on the head. Um, the the site is deteriorating, and that is partly because the um, the heating's been turned off, and just over time, it has continued to de deteriorate. And certainly, in my 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 whole lifetime, almost. Um, it has just been a constant discussion about how we need to use St Lucia's and how it is slowly falling apart. And, um, well, I fear that that trend will continue. 
Um, on Councillor uh, uh, McAleer's proposal to meet the Save Oma, Oma Jail Group, um, they held a meeting um, last month and um, my, I myself, um, I went along and um, I, well, there was a wonderful presentation by Johnny Hamill on the history of the site and it, 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 it's, it's amazing and my heritage it is to Oma. Um, I also believe from, from the Council, um, Ian Davidson went along as well and we gave, I suppose, from the well, from my personal view, and Ian gave it from a council view. Um, the issue with the jail is we are very time limited. It's a, it's going to be a private sale, but I, I do support meeting with the group, and um, it'll be very interesting if anything comes out of it. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK, members. Councillor Thompson, quick comment. Yeah, quick comment. Uh, thanks for letting me again, Chair. Just uh, with regard to Councillor Megadolf's proposal, uh, if it hasn't been seconded, I'm happy to second that. Uh, I think with regard to riverside walks and what have you, we need to be looking at right across the Oma town. There's, there's part of Oma uh, has a riverside walk, but there's other parts of it that are linked onto the river as well. And that's something we need to be looking at probably in the decades ahead. Maybe I'll not be here, but others will be. And, uh, you know, we just can't be just focusing in on one part of the town. That has to go right across to the east of the town as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've got all wrapped up there now, Kim. We had um, Councillor Dehan, Councillor McAleer proposed and seconded the the noting of the correspondence. Then we had a, a proposal from Councillor McAleer and seconded by Councillor Thompson to meet to meet with the group. And then Councillor McAleer's proposal, which was also seconded by Councillor Thompson. Okay, members all agreed on them. Thank you. Councillor McAleer. Sorry, Chair, right, just McAleer, to clarify right. there, I believe it was Councillor Dehan and Councillor McLaughlin noted the letter and then Councillor Dehan and made a further proposal just to contact the relevant that's, people. Sorry about Maybe that. that's it, no problem. Thank you. Okay, we have another piece of correspondence, 8.5 members, is um, from NA Water, and this was regarding a query raised last month, I think, around flooding. Councillor McLaughlin. I'll propose to note that I live between Manu Cross and Ardes Cross, and I'm a landowner there, so I'm getting the blame apparently, but it, it was just excessively rain. Um, I've never seen rain like it. it. It literally, it was just like emptying buckets of water constantly for about half an hour, and, and the amount of rain that fell, and Edney did, did really suffer. It took both farmers and, and fire brigade to assist the residents that were badly affected. I'm glad to see that they are addressing the problems at 23 and 25 because that has been ongoing for quite a long time and this finally brought it to a head. Uh, hopefully we'd never see rain like that again, but these once in a century episodes seem to happen once a year, so it's difficult to see what will happen, but propose a note. Thank you. Have I a seconder for a note, please? Councillor John Coyle. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm happy to second uh, the note of this. Um, it's it, it was unbelievable amount of rain that fell so um and uh, again i'll thank the council for helping residents and businesses that were affected on the day and uh, financially as well the money thank you thank you okay members that's passed okay members one to item nine there's a few people have contacted me maybe at this stage we could just take the confidential minutes and then we'll finish with aob so um Proposer for committee, please. Councillor Thompson and a seconder, Councillor Donnelly, Stephen Donnelly. Thank you. I'll we'll just pause the recording.
Okay, thank you. And Director John Boyle is going to sum up. Just sure, thank you. Uh, While some committee members considered the confidential minutes of the Regeneration and Community Committee meeting of the 11th of October 2022, and there were no matters arising. Okay, thank you, Member. So, item nine, AOB, um, Councillor. Uh, oh, sorry, just a proposal to note that update, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Gannon. So, Councillor Gannon, you had two items, just if you can bring the two proposals together, please, and be, be brief if you can. I need to turn you on, is right. Thank you, Chair. I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, I'll, the first one's simple enough. Um, so, uh, it was recently, it's just today, it was raised with me by families about the withdrawal of adult daycare cent services from Garrison. Um, so this is news that was just given today. Um, because of the late notice of it, I wasn't able to find out the reasons for it. But what I'm proposing is that we contact Lakeland Community Care, because they are the uh, organisation that runs it, and we ask them what are the, the reasons for this? Is it that they've had funding withdrawn? Is it an operational decision on their part? Uh, and if we are able to assist, if it is, say, funding's been withdrawn, if we're able to assist with lobbying to get that back, um, that would be uh, that we would be open to doing that. But just to ask them what's the cause of this, and um, if we can see about getting it back, if there's some sort of barrier to it being there. So okay, well, that's that's the proposal. Yep, that's okay. Is there a seconder for that just at this stage, Councillor Felix? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, I'll second that. I also was contacted by a couple of people there, the Garrison, Bill Cuary, about the issue, and I was uh, going to get on to um, Lake Grand Community Care tomorrow, any, but I'm happy to propose that at a second. Right, proposal. well, we'll keep moving. We'll get that letter um, actioned um, at this stage. Councillor O'Coffey. I was coming in for the next one. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Gannon, okay. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, uh, we all know about the threats to the emergency surgical services at the Southwest Acute Hospital, uh, and the campaign group has been established to save our acute uh, services, and they're running a, a number of events, including in particular a, a mass rally in support of these uh, services on the uh, 2nd of December. Uh, and Other things like uh, getting people together to form a ring of steel as a a metaphorical um, action of our services. So what I, I would just like to propose that council officers uh, get in touch with the group or, the, or if the group contacts the council before that, uh, work with the campaign to assist in whatever way possible with them with delivering the campaign, if that means looking at facilities, uh, lighting and things like that. But I'm sure that will be all discussed between officers and the campaign organizers um, you know this is huge the loss of emergency surgical services could lead to a, a just a loss of the hospital full stop uh, and obviously that can that'll devastate for mana completely devastate us uh, so this is so important anyhow I, i'll not go on chair because you asked me to be brief and we've discussed it plenty of times uh, but i'll make that proposal that, thank you yep yeah, that contact's made with the group yep councillor okafe yeah, just to, I'm happy to support that. I, I think it's uh, important that we uh, in, have a, an early engagement on that, considering the potential for a large crowd on the, the day. So thanks, Chair. Thank you, members, for, for being brief, um, because maybe this isn't just the right committee for, for that issue, but it's, it's important. So, um, Councillor John Coyle had, a, had another issue as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, I uh, have spoken to Kim um, just before the meeting, but I have uh, an unadopted road at Rathmore Clinic in Belique. Um, I have uh, been successful in getting DFA roads for to uh, commit to getting some work done, but uh, I would like to propose that the council officers uh, would take stakeholders and local landowners, uh, you know, have a meeting to ensure that uh, land needed for this upgrade uh, and statutory approvals are in place uh, so that we can try and get some funding. Um, it's an unadopted road. It's unsafe for uh, you know patients going to our local health centre. And uh, I think it, it needs to be a 5.5 metre wide uh, carriageway 
and a two meter wide footpath. So, and if, if this is successful, that maybe in the future, there may be funding from DARA or DFA for to get the works done. And uh, even if we as a community have to come together to do a wee bit of fundraising, uh, we might be able to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. And Councillor McLaughlin. Yeah, I'd like to second that. It is a very poor piece of road, and obviously there's numerous issues with who actually owns what tiny little bit of it. So it'd be nice to get it ironed out and have all our ducks in a row should funding become available. Okay. And Councillor Feely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the big issue that there's going on this long time with who owns it, and it's, it is very bad because um, a lot, lot of people, oh, nearly everybody in Garrison goes down to the League Health Centre. I'd be down there myself, bringing my uncle down there, and all, and it's very dangerous for parking outside. As is a very small car park at the Health Centre itself, only holds nine or ten cars, so it's going to be hard there. But hopefully, we can get something sorted out. Just have it sorted. Okay, well, that's past members. Well, thanks for your cooperation, members, and to your officer team and IT team and Democratic Services and. The meeting's closed now, members, and safe home. Thank you, Mark. Well done.